Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for joining us for the afternoon session. Uh, my name is Hoyt Long. I, I teach uh, Japanese literature here in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. All right. Uh, we have a, a, full, uh, a full afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a keynote speech by uh, Mrs. Muto Ruiko um, and then uh, several individual talks um, following her, her keynote speech. I'm just going to, I'll introduce uh, each speaker before their talk, but uh, I'll begin here with, to give you a little bit of background uh, on Muto-san. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome her, um, a very inspiring figure, comes to us from Fukushima. Uh, she was born in 1953, and she currently resides in Miharucho in Fukushima Prefecture, which is about 45 kilometers directly inland from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Uh, she was a former print artisan and special needs teacher who opened a cafe called Kirara in the wooded hills outside her town in 2003. And she's been involved in anti-nuclear activism since Chernobyl and was planning actually to launch a project called Hairo Action, 40 years of Fukushima nuclear power plants in early 2011 before the uh, Fukushima incident. Um, as a way, she was organizing this as a way to bring attention to the issue of nuclear power in her home region. Um, that attention soon came in ways I don't think she would have ever wanted or could have predicted. Um, the, the Fukushima catastrophe forced her to close her cafe, and ever since, uh, she's devoted her time to protecting the human rights and health of local residents and evacuees. She's the author of a book called Fukushima Kara Anatae, or From Fukushima to You. Uh, which contains the transcript of a very moving speech that she delivered and for which she is now widely known, a speech she gave in uh, September of last year at an anti-nuclear demonstration in Tokyo, uh, where over 60,000 people came out to demonstrate against uh, nuclear energy. Now, in that speech, uh, she decried the contamination of her beloved native place by an invisible pollutant, and described a situation in which local citizens were faced with impossibly difficult choices that struck at the very core of their everyday lives. Whether to flee or not, and I'm quoting from her speech here, whether to eat or not, whether to put masks on their children or not, whether to hang out their laundry or not, whether to till the fields or not, whether to say something or to remain silent. And they faced like, these decisions all the while wondering whether the government was telling them the truth or using them as experimental subjects. She called on her audience to please not forget Fukushima, um, a plea that has uh, resonated ever since that talk and has become a kind of mantra for those, um, for many. Um, today she's gonna speak about what has happened in the time since the disaster about her continued efforts to represent the needs of uh, afflicted citizens, and about how the community has variously held together, but also been divided by the effects of the tragedy as they continue to uh, play out in Fukushima. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Ms. Muto Ruiko. みなさんこんにちは。福島から参りました。元ルイコと申します。今日ここでお話をさせていただくことをとても光栄に思います。よろしくお願いいたします。I'm I lived in Fukushima Prefecture approximately 45 kilometers in the mountains, and I owned and ran a small cafe. It was a very quiet place, uh, blessed with the bounties of nature. However, my life has changed completely since the nuclear accident. I would like to tell you a little bit about what's been going on since that time. On March 11th, um, after the earthquake and the tsunami attacked us, we heard that the control rods had been inserted into the, into the core and that uh, the reactor had, had been brought to a stop. However, towards evening that day, we found 
that the electrical sources that were meant to cool the reactors had failed. I knew a little bit about what that meant, and I knew that it was very serious, so I went around warning friends in the neighborhood to leave, and we ourselves left. And during that time, we, ha we ha had no instructions from the government. From that night, people started evacuating from within three kilometers of the reactor. The next day, reactor number one exploded, and the evacuation zone was extended to 20 kilometers. Of those people who had been attacked by the tsunami, there were some who were still alive at that point. But the rescuers themselves had to leave, and therefore were unable to save some of those. There were many domestic animals as well as pets in that evacuation zone, and many elderly people died in the course of trying to evacuate. The evacuation itself was daunting for many elderly people and those with disabilities. Life in the evacuation centers themselves was also challenging. What did the government of Japan do during that time? Well, it um, withheld information that was yielded from this computerized system, the System for Prediction of Environmental Emergency Dose Information. It did not tell the people about the meltdown of the reactors. And in order to minimize the, the scope of the accident, uh, it embarked on a safety campaign. Uh, there were uh, radiation risk control managers who started out from areas that had the highest levels of exposure and went around telling people, it's all right, please be reassured. And they went around the prefecture, leaving no corner un untouched. And moreover, the government raised the levels of radiation exposure to be admitted um, per year. And what did citizens do in response? Very few of them received any iodine tablets. Many of them ended up fleeing into areas with higher levels of radiation. They started cl cleanup work um, from the earthquake. Adults waited in long lines for water delivery trucks with their children. Very quickly thereafter, after school activities resumed. People, of course, were unsure about what information to trust, and therefore they began to be divided. The parent who sent her child with a canteen because she didn't trust the drinking water at school was told that since the other children were going to drink the tra tap water at school, that's what that child should do also. There was a junior high school student who said she, her, she didn't want to be alone um, in seeking safety, that what, what was going to happen to the friends who were to be left behind. There are many households in which, given work and mortgages, the father has stayed behind in Fukushima, and mother and children have gone to other prefectures so that they've been maintaining a split existence. In some towns, there are gigantic indoor playgrounds, which have jungle gyms and swings and sandboxes, and children appear to be playing happily in those places, but there is no light from the sun or cooling breeze or the voice of birds. And strange monitoring posts began to appear in towns and villages that steadily report the levels of contamination in the air. And ha a year having passed, the government, as if this were the only thing it could be doing, allocated a huge sum of money to decontamination. And in those places, other than the sites of the nuclear plants, um, the governments are calling on those who had evacuated to start returning. There's no support whatsoever for the right of people to evacuate or to seek relief. As for the decontamination, um, it's the large, the major construction companies that have uh, gotten hold of the business. And the people who do the actual labor um, while exposing themselves to radiation are those who have lost their uh, homes and their jobs thanks to the disaster rah, rah, you know, do your best no matter what, Fukushima. Under that slogan, reconstruction is being called for. I understand perfectly one's attachment to, to one's home place, but the, these calls sound bleak to me. In one city, from starting this April, the beginning of the new year, um, restrictions on outdoor activity have been lifted. There are marathons in which young children participate, and elementary school kids uh, take part in drum and, and flute bands uh, marching outside.
and middle schoolers from other prefectures have come to clean up the rubble on the coast, in the coastal areas as volunteers. The safety campaign is, is finding ways to burrow into um, small gatherings, gatherings for, um, for cancer, um, cancer, ways to deal with cancer. And there have been instances where suppliers for school lunches have been found to be falsifying the place of origin of the foods they're serving. The Japanese government is exerting subtle pressure on supermarkets and other stores that have set up their own stricter standards than the government standards, saying that excessive regulation is bound to bring on confusion. The state's choice not to come up with any policy has actually uh, driven people into further subjection to discrimination and division. They're single mothers of children with disabilities who are having an especially hard time evacuating to other areas or to seek relief. Where they have to live with the guilt of continuously exposing their children to radiation. People who are uh, concerned about uh, radiation or who appeal that they would like to evacuate or seek protection are, are uh, talked about as people who worry too much. And the definition of boundaries for evacuation as well as payment for compensation has been driving people into further division. People are worried about their children's health and they need to be protected in every way possible. And at the same time, those who have disabilities are being subjected to further discrimination and division, and their sense of being exposed to risk is further intensifying. On the grounds of insufficient electricity supply, there's a call for the restart of reactors, and furthermore, for the sake of economic progress, to start exporting nuclear reactors. But there have been constant earthquakes this year in March and April, and um, now that uh, the, the situation with Reactor 4, which we also heard about this morning, that, um, that which has been the, where the pool, the spent fuel pool, is exposed and the structure itself is in precarious state because of explosions. Um, every day we're worrying about the collapse of this, of this unit. People have been pushed around, wounded, and exhausted. And what happens at length is that they begin to let go of their wariness about radiation. We have no choice but to go on living here, they say, so we don't want to hear anything more, and they stop their ears. The division going on amongst the people penetrates to every aspect of their lives, just as radioactive materials do. And uh, the last year, at the end of the year, the Japanese government declared cold shutdown of the Fukushima and an end to the accident. And the media reported this faithfully. However, for the victims, nothing about this accident is over. That is the very nature of a nuclear accident. I learned about the danger of nuclear reactors for the first time 26 years ago when the Chernobyl accident took place. From the uh, mining of uranium to spent nuclear fuel has uh, necessitated the exposure of Native Americans the production of depleted uranium in the intermediate stage turn, um, has resulted in weapons that go on to harm the health of the children of Iraq and Afghanistan. And in the operation and periodic inspection of nuclear reactors, um, the, the daily, the, or, the routine um, exposure of workers cannot be avoided. And if there's an accident, as has happened at Chernobyl or Fukushima, then ordinary citizens have to be um, exposed to massive amounts as well. I was quite despairing about the nuclear issue even bef before this accident. Um, the Earth had been soiled by an atmospheric tests and nuclear power accidents, that this um, pollution had produced waste that would continue to be dangerous for tens of thousands of years. I have wondered if human beings had put their hands to something that we should never have started with. Wasn't this an arrogant act on the part of humanity, this accident which has necessarily swept in all forms of life with all the radioactive substances that have dispersed? What are we to do with the earth that have been contaminated by these 
It is very painful to think that we are imposing this, leaving our young people to deal with this. Ever since the Chernobyl accident, I have been uh, busy within Fukushima Prefecture with various actions against uh, nuclear power. Um, I've participated in many lectures. I've uh, made uh, statements, protests to the local governments and, to and TEPCO, negotiated with them, petition um, act collection, um, pushed for plebiscites, and written um, newsletters. However, I found that something that is particularly, uh, that I, I feel myself particularly suited for is nonviolent direct action. I'm not so comfortable explaining the technical aspects of nuclear power or the social arrangements, but um, to, to place my body on that spot and to appeal from that is something that has felt very comfortable for me. At the time of um, an ac uh, the big accident at Fukushima number two plant, Dainyi, I organized a relay hunger strike um, by women. And in 1992, uh, at Dokkasho village in Aomori prefecture, I started up an action of a camp of women who don't need nuclear power. Um, it's, it was at the time when uranium hexafluoride was going to be uh, kept, transported into Rokkasho for um, enrichment and re reprocessing and enrichment. Women from all over Japan gathered to try to stop the trucks. And we, had a, a, we set up tents and stayed there for a month. On the day that the truck was to arrive, we, with the, the signal of singing, um, we women, one by one, looked for places where the security was lax or thin, and we went out into the road and sat down. And even though we were pulled away many, many times, we were able to stop the truck for 50 minutes. With the accident this time, we have all, I have also organized um, women of Fukushima, 100 women of Fukushima sit down, um, 100 women who don't need nuclear power sitting down in front of the Ministry of Economics, Trade and Industry. There were women who joined us who had never before participated in any kind of action like that. From all over Japan, we had over 2,000 women joining us. And we're continuing to have actions such as negotiations with TEPCO. And we're also um, uh, holding a relay hunger strike. Today, May 5th, all 54 reactors um, with, through routine maintenance inspection have gone into a halt. Um, so it's a moment of zero nuclear power. And in front of the min uh, Ministry of, of Economics, Trade and Industry in Tokyo, there are many people dancing an old folk dance um, that has been transmitted in Fukushima, the Kansho dance, and dancing it around the building of the ministry. I believe that right now they are all dancing this dance. And um, Ms. Muto explained to me a little bit that it is, it is a, a dance for the Festival of the Dead normally in August. And, and the hand and, and foot actions are for appeasing the souls of the dead. But it's also because in traditional societies there weren't that many sources of pleasure that even um, that's the season for the souls of the returning, the returning souls of the dead was a time for taking uh, pleasure. And it's, well, carnivalesque. And um, it's, it's, it's a dance that she has taught many people to dance. And now it's become part of this anti-nuclear action. I have involved myself. I have invested in women's action not because I want to reject men. <laughs> Throughout history, women have suffered enormously from discrimination and oppression. However, in this world of the primacy of the economy and dog-eat-dog -dog world of competition, I'm wondering if, the people, if, if it's not men who are really being oppressed most on the front lines. In, such a, in, in that sense, I'm wondering if there isn't some remaining special power um, that women have, um, women who can act spontaneously, intuitively, um, softly and yet patiently uh, with endurance, who can, who can find pleasure, who can, th who can say to themselves, um, something's going to work out anyway. 
I'm wondering if, if in these modes of thought and action, there isn't some sort of clue to imagining a different society. On the morning of the sit-in, sit this is what I said to the women. Welcome, brave women, you who have come from far and near, expending your own time and energy and money. Thank you, each and every one of you. I feel that um, the limitlessly deep love and clear intelligence and the power of nonviolence is going to help create a new world. Let's sit together, talk to each other, and sing. And the citizens of Fukushima are engaged in different um, possibilities, different actions every day. How they might um, aid the uh, evacuation of young people and children to places where the radiation rates levels are lower, to places where they can get some relief. And there are people from all over Japan who are engaged in this effort. They're trying to make routes of transport of safe food, of how you can get a, 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 acquire safe food, and have set up citizens' um, food radiation measuring stations. They're also working very hard, taking the initiative in establishing uh, laws and ordinances to protect those who have suffered. Since March, we have been organizing to get the state to bring criminal charges against TEPCO and uh, those uh, people, with government people within the regulatory agency. We hope in June to have a 1,000 people uh, be part of this uh, action and we are working vigorously toward that end. The money from the t-shirts outside will go to this effort, by the way. Uh, I think it's extremely important that those who have been victimized stand up and be able to plead their, what has happened to them in their own words. I think that this is a way uh, in which the, the feelings of those who have been divided can once again be linked together that they can actually comfort each other's injuries, heal each other's injuries. And um, it's also a process whereby strength and dignity can be recovered. The government of Japan, for the sake of in prioritizing economic growth, has put, con um, has put effort into creating a citizenry who would be uh, docile laborers and consumers. Uh, the anger of citizens has been locked in. Society and schools and the mass media have all uh, cooperated, collaborated in, in trying to keep people from thinking. And we were beautifully duped by this effort. I think it is really crucial right now for citizens to recover their confidence and their pride. Each of us must think with our own heads and to engage in action that each of us can do. I think that's very important because each of us, in fact, has wonderful powers. And from here, I would like to um, show you a little bit the kind of life I had before the nuclear disaster. In the course of my activism against nuclear power, I frequently find, found myself being overwhelmed by despair about the nuclear weapons and um, uh, radioactive substances that were overwhelming the Earth. And at such times, what I began to think about was what my own life was like. The electricity that we use without giving it a second thought. What is the process whereby it's, create, crea uh, it's created? It necessarily involves various forms of discrimination and the sacrifice of life, that our, the electricity we use so casually is, is, necessitates that sacrifice and that discrimination. And I began to think that I wanted to place my own life at the opposite end from that. And that's, what, that's when I began to cultivate a mountain and to, to become self-sufficient in my lifestyle. This is the, the side of a little a hill, small mountain that my grandfather left me. 
You see me uh, cutting down trees, peeling off the bark, and creating pillars. I've been using those pillars to flatten and firm the earth and to establish poles, um, in, set, plant them in the earth. I'm digging up a tree root there. I've attached a rope to a car jack and trying to get the root out of the ground. Three years have passed and I finally have a little level land. And that's the view from above, making steps. We finally had enough la flat land, level land, to build a little hut. So we began to live there and to the left you see a sink that we found had been tossed away. I'm cutting branches of cherry wood to use for smoking. Smoking whatever, food. <laughs> And three years later, we were able to build another um, uh, uh, structure, and finally we were able to cook indoors. This little white plastic tank you see, we'd fill with water on warm days, and the water would get warm enough to use for showering. And several years later, I retired from teaching, and I got some uh, retirement money, and so we asked a carpenter to build this structure. <laughs> This is Kirara at night. I think you noticed some solar panels and a couple of shots ago, all of this light comes from the solar panels. These are acorns. In my cafe, we had a practice of serving foods using acorn. Why acorns? Well, in Japan, there was a period called the Jomon era, said to have lasted 10,000 years. It is said the archeological work has excavated uh, tools for hunting but no tools for killing human beings have been found. I began to ask myself, what kind of people were they who managed to get through 10,000 years, 10, years without having a major war? So I began to think that maybe if I gathered acorns and began to eat it, that there might be some hint contained therein about their secret. These are the acorns, the kinds of acorns, and if you look closely, they seem so similar, but each one is different in shape and luster. Um, there, from what I can tell from the botanical dictionary, there are various kinds of, kinds of oak. So I gather them and sort them and dry them like this. There's <laughs> a lot of tannic acid in acorns. So I boil them maybe 30 times, changing the water about 30 times. I, I think it's too wasteful to use gas for this process, so I only do it during the seasons when we need a stove. This is a larva that grows and inhabits the acorn. And when it matures, it turns into this insect. If you saute this insect in a frying pan and sprinkle a little salt, it's very delicious. And the mystery of it all is that the acorn is bitter, but the acorn worm is not. <laughs> this is my wood pile. This wood pile has been thoroughly contaminated, so I can no longer use my wood burning stove. What you see in front is a wild mink. The parent is feeding the baby swallows. This is a migratory bird. This is a, tr uh, this is a bird that always comes close to you if you're splitting wood. It's looking for the insects that are found inside the, the wood butterfly that's come to a flower that I painted on my door. <laughs> a cicada that's, um, that's climbed up to molt. Um, beetle wet in the rain. She wants you to notice the feelers that are very sweet. This is a mountain fowl. Once, one morning, we heard a huge sound, and it was this bird that had burst through some glass and landed inside. I've heard that they, um, when they're chased by hawks, they might just break the glass and come in to escape. And our whole shop was filled with glass. <laughs> and this is a, a Japanese bee. It, it, it nested between the roof and the ceiling. These are bees cooling themselves, coming out of their hive. And so we made a bee hut hive, and we began to have honey. You soak these bees in alcohol, and it creates... Um, uh, it's something you can put on your skin if you get a bee sting and it instantly relieves the pain. It's a kind of silkworm, a wild one. Has no, it's not um, poisonous or irritating at all. I understand that before nylon was developed, that it was the silken thread of this worm that was used for fishing line. And I learned how to make it from an old man in the neighborhood. This is the original um, ingredient that turns into the silk thread that can be found 
in the belly of the, of the worm. You soak this in vinegar and then stretch it out with your hands and this is the kind of line that you can get in the end. We were planning to go uh, fishing with uh, a, a hook made from a deer antler by a friend. That was what we had planned. But because those friends evacuated and have left for far away, we haven't been able to realize this, this uh, dream, this plan. This is, this is um, a device for making charcoal that you, you burn wood in your stove and when it turns bright red, you put it in that black container with the lid. And then you can transfer that to the um, hibachi-like thing on the right and shooting with a knife. And um, that was very good for making our rice. We had absolutely no need to use gas in the winter time. So we could make our rice, then we can have our hot water bottle, and on the far left is a, is a stone which has been heated and you wrap it up and you hold it to yourself at night and it keeps you cozy. This is something belonging to my mother. It's an iron that you put charcoal inside. This is something that we were using in my house when I was a child. It's a steaming hearth and you put rice inside. This is something that uses solar um, heat to heat water. And summertime, we draw that water into the bathtub, and that was what we needed for bathing. This is a solar cooker. Um, it's very cheap and easy to make. And in that black container in the center, we have pumpkins, and it takes about two hours to cook. <laughs> this is a little bit more refined. Um, in the center, you see rice cooking, and it only takes about 30 minutes. So you can have this rod in the middle, and you turn it manually so that no shadow is cast. And that makes it very efficient for cooking your rice. These are all second-hand solar panels that we were able to get cheaply. 550-watt system. This is, um, this is a recycled battery, one that uh, was thought to have outlived its useful life, but this is usable in this way. It, you, it stores electricity, and it only emits electricity that's been stored. The instrument on the left is a transformer that converts the, the charge so that it can be used for household purposes. So this is a simpler system of about 170 watts, consisting of a panel and a battery and light. The battery I use here um, is used for wheelchairs. I have many, many friends with disabilities, so when it's time to change the battery for a wheelchair, I get those batteries which are of very good quality. This is my forest with lots of maples and cherries and oak trees and many acorns. But because of the nuclear disaster, my modest life is still um, blessed with the abundance of nature and using the resources given as nature for conducting my life. Well, that life is no longer possible. The contamination of the earth will take many, uh, a long, long period of time to, uh, for the earth to be restored. I think it's, it's a time when we have to think very deeply about uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear energy around the world. We need to think very carefully about consumption, the use of energy. We need to think about what constitutes a truly abundant, prosperous life. I think we let us think about these things together and think about the actions that each of us can take. The life that I tried to show you through these slides was not a life of endurance or of doing without for me. It was actually really pleasurable to try to figure things out, to see what I could do. So it was a very, it was a very joy-filled life. The Fukushima nuclear disaster resulted in the worst possible situation. At the same time, it has brought many of us together. I am here talking with you today. Perhaps it is an opportunity for citizens to come together, to join hands and support each other. And why don't we do that in the hopes of creating a new world? Thank you very much.
So it's, uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, this, the keynote is scheduled to go till 2.50, and it's uh, 2.15 now. So um, we'll, we'd like to open the floor um, to any questions you might have for uh, Ms. Muto. Ruiko Mutasan, can you tell us uh, what is the current situation regarding uh, returning to your land and the situation with radioactivity on the land and um, things you have to be concerned about with that? The air levels, the contamination levels, uh, in the air in where I live is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 microsieverts an hour. I myself have stopped um, cultivating, growing crops outside, or picking berries and acorns. As I said earlier, uh, many, many, many people, in fact, the majority of people, have grown weary of, tr of st coping with this existence, and it's only a small minority that still want to get information and continue to struggle. So how are people making a living, the ones that had to be evacuated, how are they making a living? Is the government supporting them? えっと、several groups, those who are very close in the evacuation areas have gotten, uh, have moved out and, and get some assistance from the government in paying for rent in those areas. But then those who are outside that area, even though they may be living where there are a lot of hot spots, are unable to get any sort of assistance whatsoever, so they're living off their savings and find, looking for part-time work. Um, I have a question. When the boundary was extended by the United States, uh, were the people in your area aware of that, and uh, what were your reactions to that? はい、あの、知っていました。で、アメリカの人もあの、友達の中にいました。Yes, yes we were aware of that. I have Americans and French people among my friends. Um, and we knew that the boundary evacuation boundary had been extended, but but the Japanese government did nothing. Um, my question is how the Hibakusha effect is affecting society and the families and the people in the different neighborhoods. <laughs> the first people who raised their voices were the, the mothers of young children who went to the, the central government and also local government to protest the raising of permissible exposure levels to 20 millisieverts a year, very, very high level, um, internationally speaking. And um, the government did not withdraw that standard, but um, we, they did seem to have had an, have made an impact. And, and on an individual level, they call their local government, the central government, and TEPCO, but I believe it's still a very small number who engage in such efforts. Uh, first, I want to say thank you so much for sharing the story and the insights into your life in Fukushima um, before 3.11. Uh, my question um, is uh, in response to, um, you had mentioned several times discrimination and division that had come up um, and the sort of activist response to try to remedi remedy this. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit uh, and talk about um, what some of that discrimination looked like and what groups were um, experienced the most. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I have a lot of uh, people with disabilities around, them, around me, and it was exceedingly difficult for them to try to evacuate. And those who did had a very hard time securing vehicles that were equipped to transport them. Um, if they were ch accused of having used um, uh, extended hours for the helper, then they were not paid. Um, aid uh, money um, that they might have received. There are places where uh, people with disabilities can work, and I tried to organize two such places that would secure 
uh, instruments for measuring levels of contamination in food. And disabled people could come there, but, they, but also people without disabilities could come bring their food to, to have levels of radiation measured. But in principle, it was the, those with disabilities who were doing the measuring, so it was their work and, and, and their agency in a way. And so we set up two such area centers. And as I mentioned, those who, lead, who want to evacuate on their own are not going to get any financial aid. And so it's very difficult. I mean, either they have savings that they can use or they have none. And in those cases, we have been trying to organize so that at least those children could get away to safe places or um, be provided with safe food. So that's another kind of activity we've been engaging in. I would like to ask you if you think that you are this generation's answer to the generations before you that simply said, Shogunai, um, I have a number of uh, older people, a generation older than I am, friends in Japan, and I have at times tried to ask them about Hiroshima, Nagasaki, etc. And the answer I always got from them is, of course, well, it couldn't be helped. That's just the way it was. And it sounds as if, in a slightly different sense, the people in Fukushima today are saying, what can we do? We can't fight the government. We can't live. Is, is that also like Shogunai? And are you the answer to that? <sighs> I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but I, and I don't know if my um, activism, what I'm engaged in, is an answer or provides any sort of solution for those who have given up. Uh, but what I think is really important is um, that for those who have given up, uh, they are. I am very sure that they still are harboring many kinds of anxieties and that it's the state that is encouraging them to stay in a state of giving up. And so in the first instance, I think that we need to um, have um, sites, fora, where these people can come together and share the anxieties and the fears that they're carrying within themselves and that by expressing themselves that they may come to a different, um, co co be able to work through that sense of being locked in with their, with their solitary fears and, and feeling locked in and isolated in an environment where people no longer talk about radiation and therefore it seems wrong to bring it up. え、どうしたらいいかっていうことを話し合ったりする、そういうその場っていうものを作ることがまああの最初は大事かなっていうふうに思います。そしてそういう話し合いの中であのいろんなことがあの気づいたり、自分の中にそれを何か変えていく力があ
Bobby Paul has spent almost 25 years supporting the vision of Juan's founder, Dr. Helen Caldicott, uh, which is to gradually rid the world of nuclear weapons. She's also helped the Georgia chapter define its three areas of concentration across the state and the southeast region. And these three areas are peace in action, environmental justice, and empowering people to act politically. Uh, and as I understand it, the group helps to translate technical information about nuclear weapons and waste, uh, its effects on national security, and its environmental impacts into terms meaningful to its members and to the communities that live near nuclear facilities. Uh, Bobby Paul has for over 15 years watchdog the Savannah River site, uh, which is a massive nuclear weapons complex uh, built in the 1950s by DuPont and located just uh, to the southeast, southeast of Augusta, Georgia. And she'll be talking a little bit about um, her efforts, with her involvement with that site, uh, and also her campaigns to successfully restore the Department of Energy's uh, environmental monitoring, monitoring of the SRS site. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Bobby Paul. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I have a little sign in front of my desk in Atlanta where my office is, although we are across Georgia, that says, in calligraphy, if thank you is the only prayer you ever say in your whole life, that would suffice. And so I thank you, all of you speakers, everyone for being here, um, Ms. Muto, um, oh, granny glasses, um, I'm sorry. Norma, Roger, Mr. Koide, Jeff, Dean, who we've yet to hear from, all my email buddies who we probably don't know each other but might be on the no nu new nukes y'all list, I see a few. It's nice to meet people in person. And I'd like to say a special thank you to Elizabeth Baldwin and Steve Leeper. Steve is the director of the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation. He's the first non-Japanese person to head up this organization. I happen to go to college with these people down in Florida. And they also uh, live, when they're not in Hiroshima, they live in Atlanta. So we are very close friends. Um, and I just, uh, Elizabeth just came back from Fukushima yesterday, and I said, what should I tell the people? And she said, tell them for, for every six people or five or six people you ask, you'll get nine or ten different uh, reactions of what to do and what is being done. For example, as you've heard, some people won't give food to their children or will give food or will, won't give food but will hang their clothes on the line and everybody seems to be in this, what we've heard, this state of confusion having been oppressed. Um, well, why am I here? Uh, you've talked about Juan. There is a larger network. I want to say we were founded as Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament. And we have never left that mission, even though our national organization in 90 changed its name to New Directions, thinking that the Cold War was over and we were going to have policy change and, you know, we were going to really, you know, just clean it all up. But um, we are near the Savannah River site, and you all have a handout. These things are not just about wand. You have this little thing that is an explanation of this. I'm big on geography. And even before we get to that, since we were talking about, Mr. Koide was talking about seismic activity, I included a little map of the United States. So if you want to find Georgia and South Carolina on that in the southeast, about six, 700 miles, down road, as they say in the south, down road. I'm actually from Philadelphia, don't let it fool you. <laughs> but anyway, um, you can see that there is some seismic activity. In fact, after 9, after 9 11, <laughs> our new 3 11 is our new 9 11, we believe. Um, they were talking about Charleston on the map, where one of the largest earthquakes in 1881, it was well over seven, I think it was close to eight. Uh, on the Richter scale there. There are little earthquakes all the time in, a, in the Augusta, Georgia area. They measure 2.1, 2.8, something small, but around the Savannah Riverside area. So um, I don't know, do I need the mic? You took my mic. All right. <laughs> all right, uh, you can hear me. Oh, thank you. OK, whoa, OK. I just want you to know when I say Savannah Riverside, a lot of people, even in Georgia and, and South Carolina, think it's down here in Savannah on the Atlantic Ocean. 
The Savannah River site is what we call Frankenstein's brain. It's up here, it's 310 square miles. It was built in the 50s. There were five nuclear reactors in the center of it. We made plutonium and tritium for bombs. Currently, we still extract tritium from rods sent down from Watts Bar, Tennessee to keep our bombs virile, as Helen would say. Um, I like to think tritium is the uh, uh, radioactive hydrogen that they put in the capsule of the bomb that gives it lift or boost. So I call it kind of Viagra for missiles. And so that's what, that's what we do right there continually. Okay, right across the river. This is about 120 miles upstream, okay? This, it, they call it Aiken. When I first heard it was in Aiken, I couldn't believe it because Aiken is up here, not downwind downstream, very rich horsey set in South Carolina, but they claim that address. Okay, here, uh, this also is where they're trying to build the MOX fabrication plant right now, a huge environmental boondoggle, fiscal boondoggle, which we're trying to defeat in Congress. There are many people right now working to defeat that. Uh, right to President Obama, right to your senator. Obviously, the senators in South Carolina want this. It's a jobs program, it's the second largest jobs program in South Carolina. But as you know, MOX fuel was present in Reactor 3 in Fukushima. The biggest thing about MOX that you didn't hear about from Mr. Rosner, Rosner was it? That there are no customers who want this fuel. So we're spending billions and billions and nobody wants it, possibly Tennessee Valley Authority, which is our own government. Okay, right across here is Georgia. Okay, Atlanta's up here. It's about 100 and um, it takes me about three hours from Atlanta to get down to this community that I'd like to focus on today where Plant Vogel currently is called Shell Bluff. It's called Shell Bluff because eons ago the ocean used to be up here. There are native people who live here. We work with the Yamasee tribe who are down in Savannah now who are just absolutely devastated that this earth has been turned over. Vogel 1 and 2, right here, Plant Vogel, came online in 87 and 89, respectively. That's about 25 years ago. The area of Shell Bluff at that time used to be really thriving. A lot of, it's farmland in Burke County, one of the biggest counties in Georgia. How many counties do we have in Georgia? 159. It's very much a slave mentality and a very much a plantation mentality. Divide and conquer is what happens here in Georgia. This is where they want to build two more reactors. They have most of their approval right now. They have loan guarantees, and they have construction work in progress that was voted through by our Georgia General Assembly and approved by our Public Service Commission. We had 71 Georgia Power or Southern Company lawyers pushing this uh, legislation through to basically tax all ratepayers. This is all about money. So much money and power, whichever you want to put first. And I think this goes along with our message today with our sisters and brothers in Fukushima. The people in this community, when Savannah Riverside was built, they moved eight towns to make this community, this weapon site. They never once told any of the people across the river, downstream, downwind, that they might have some things to think about, to worry about. It was shrouded in secrecy, just like Rocky Flats. We have a speaker coming from there tomorrow to, um, who wrote a book about it, Kristen Iverson. They said they thought it was, they were making cleaning household products at Rocky Flats, out there at that weapons. Most of Rocky Flats things have been sent to Savannah River site. It is a super fun site. It is one of the most toxic place. Next to Hanford, which has more volume, we actually have more curies of radiation at the Savannah River site. So already we have nuclear dumps by the riverside. When Plant Vogel was first built, they wanted four, possibly six reactors, and they said it was gonna cost for four, $600 million. They only got, how many? Two, right? And do you know what the cost was? 8.9 billion. 1,200% increase. 
and the largest, followed by the largest rate payer increase in the history of Georgia Power. Georgia Power being the daughter of Southern Company, Southern Company being one of the most powerful companies in the world. Do you remember the energy talks soon after President Bush came in office that were very hush-hush and they wouldn't say who was there with Dick Cheney and all of that? Southern Company was there. Southern Company also was given an $8.33 billion, $8 billion loan or a loan guarantee from the federal government. So all of your dollars are going to expand nuclear plant Vogel. I, do, I did include a wonderful fact sheet. It's six pages from the un, uh, uni, um, Union of Concerned Scientists in your program. Um, I tried to have enough for everyone. They came out with this in January. And if you look through that, I'm not going to go through it because I want to get to the people and what we're really talking about in Shell Bluff. Um, so in their thinking now with Quip, one of their things is, well, we want to avoid sticker shock on these next two. So we are going to charge you for something. As my friend said, it's like ordering a car that hasn't been designed yet. It's going to be built in a plant that hasn't be built, been built yet, and you're going to pay for it for five years, and then you're going to get to drive it. And that's basically what Quip is about. Construction, work in progress. So they have, they have this in Florida. They've been trying to defeat it in Iowa, and it's coming to a state near you if these people have their way. I should say, I sound pretty strident here. At the bottom of my heart, I really don't think these things are ever going to be built or turned on. I, I heard the other day that some Southern Company executives were all selling their stock like crazy. <laughs> so maybe there's really something going on. <laughs> I don't know. But... Um, we w at WAND have to work with our heads, our hearts, and our limbs to fight this. How we fought this when we heard that the nuclear renaissance was coming was I went to Emory University to Turner Environmental Law Clinic and asked for pro bono legal assistance. It's been five or six years now, and they're doing a wonderful job. They're also challenging the loan guarantees, but we had to work through the early site permit which is where they get to move everything around except for building the reactors. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> and then the construction and operating license. Um, but before we go on, because I think I've talked a lot technically, I'd like to take you to Shell Bluff to meet some people that I work with and have gotten to know. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I keep thinking they're talking to me. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to being inclusive in the room. <laughs> Usually I'd ask everybody to stand up and tell me where they're from and what they do, but I don't think we'll do that today. Um, in fact, I met, you're going to meet Annie Laura Howard Stevens, and she came to one of our legal um, meetings in Augusta, Georgia. Augusta, Georgia being right here. Anybody watch the uh, Augusta National Golf thing? They don't allow women members there either. I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> um, anyway, Annie Laura heard our people talking about Plant Vogel and testifying against it. And the still small voice, which she talks about all the time, spoke to her and said, speak now forever hold your, or forever hold your peace. So she got the courage to get up and go to the podium, which I should be, I'm supposed to be standing here, and, and, make, and make a statement. And we thought, who is this woman who has the courage? Because this is a community of mostly African American people, poor, agrarian, who are intimidated, who suffer all kinds of oppression. It reminds me of kind of the 50s. I was born in 49. And um, I just can't believe the courage it takes to speak out. The only refuge and safe place a lot of people have are the churches. And so uh, tomorrow we'll be honoring four reverends of four different churches who have allowed a safe haven for people to come and gather and speak out. Okay, so I don't think we need to lower the lights. This is a CNN report that was done actually two years ago, April 20, 2010. And they wanted to come down to Shell Bluff and Annie Laura said, well, they can only come if they live here for at least two days. Because she said, Bobby, we have to live here. And Miss Muto, I mean, 
your life changed because of Fukushima. These people's lives are already in an oppressed state. And when they contemplate what could, well, they do have accents, but what could happen at Vogel, they only go to Jesus, mainly. Um, and you will see Annie Laura showing her form here. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Okay, Chris, I'm going to do it. <laughs> The people in Shell Bluff want someone to try to figure out why the cancer rates are so high. Shell Bluff already has two reactors. And on top of that, it's across the river from an old nuclear weapons plant, which is a super fun toxic site. We went to Shell Bluff for a full 24 hours where the ground has already been broken for the new reactors and let the people there voice their concerns. These are the first reactors being built in the United States in nearly 30 years. We're about to meet this one woman. Um, this is Annie Laura Stevens, and she's actually here with her brother who recently passed away. She lives in Shell Bluff, and she has concerns about the two new reactors as well as the two existing reactors that are in her town. Shell Bluff is located in Burke County, Georgia. Its cancer death rate is 51% higher than the national average, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Coming in. Hi. Hi. I'm Abby. Oh, hello, Abby. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Well, thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Right away, she introduces us to a local reverend. You know, we were here doing a story on the reactors, and um, he's concerned about his congregation. Yeah, you hear that there's a lot of cancer, related cancer, maybe respiratory and circulatory uh, things that's going on with them. You know, why is there so much in such a small population? This community fears contamination from both the nearby nuclear power plant and an old nuclear weapons facility, a Superfund toxic site across the river. In 1991, the National Cancer Institute studied all counties near nuclear facilities and found no increased risk for cancer. But another study in 2007 focused only on Burke County. Now, it found that since the reactors have been built, cancer rates have risen by 25%. But the study doesn't say why. Earlier, I showed you the picture of Annie Laura's brother, Hiram, who died of cancer in 2008. After we left the church, we met Hiram's wife, Janie. Why, you know, how could, I mean, you know, for him to be the type man he was, how could this just happen like that and so quick? I talked to a few people at the Bible study who said they didn't want the new reactors in. How did you feel? Well, I don't think anybody really want them here. I mean, because they're right on, like on, right on top of us. Do you think the president has done enough to make sure that people like you are safe before new reactors are built? Mm, he probably don't even know we exist. <laughs> <in this. laughs> he don't right. even know we're down he here. He don't even know we down here, so he don't even know our name. So. Uh -uh. <laughs> so, uh, we're back at Annie Laura's house. She showed us this emergency information pamphlet about what what they need to do in case there's a, some sort of leak at Plant Vogel, which is the um, nuclear plant in town. And we were looking at it and noticed that she circled her evacuation route. And next to it, she says, have mercy upon us all. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows power plants to monitor themselves to see if they're contaminating the environment. Both the NRC and the plant's operator say the facility is safe. It's the morning of day two here in Shell Bluff. We're headed over to the church right now. I think that more people are realizing that CNN is in town and um, people are sort of reaching out, wanting to talk and tell their stories. We had protests and we voiced our opinion and we didn't want them, but it, it was just, you know, we're just a little peon, so. This is after she had got cancer. She was the people that we've talked to are concerned that people in their family are getting sick and even dying from cancer, but they're not saying that it's caused, they're not saying the cancer is caused from the reactors. They're just concerned and they have questions about why so many of their family members are dying from cancer. Not only the older folks, you're talking about the young folks are dying. 
with cancer, throat cancer, stomach cancer. And they saying it's from what? The food, the water? Is it in the air? We're about to meet with a couple of the guys who do environmental testing at nuclear sites throughout the state of Georgia. I'm Abby. Jim Somerville, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Abby, Jim Hardeman. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, so all this stuff was for your environmental all testing? The, all this stuff was for environmental testing. And now it's just, just sitting here in a warehouse or yeah, what? Yeah, most of this equipment was taken out of service at the end of 2004 Okay. Uh, when our federal funding ran out. And how much federal funding do you get? Uh, right now, none. Nothing? Nothing. Hardeman says they're still doing limited environmental monitoring around the reactors, and he does feel they're safe. How is anybody supposed to do a long-term health study on the people in Shell Bluff? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer to it. Okay. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, you, you can't do that kind of study unless you've got the data to base it on. I mean, otherwise you're just speculating as to what might be there or what might not. But well, we're leaving here with so many questions. I mean, who's watching out for these people? Where is the government accountability? They want there to be a long-term health study, and they don't understand why no one is knocking on their door asking for blood samples or hair samples or, or whatever the case may be, why no one is testing their well water. And those are the kinds of things that they're hoping will happen before two new reactors um, are built in their community. Just days after leaving Shell Bluff, we talked to the Department of Energy about what we learned. Since then, the department now plans to reinstate its federal funding to the state of Georgia for independent environmental monitoring. The money will officially be designated to the Superfund toxic site across the river, but depending upon how much funding the state gets will determine the amount of additional testing that can be done in other parts of this community. And we also talked to the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the agency says it's now commissioning a new national health study to re-examine the cancer risks for people living near nuclear power plants. They say the study will get started sometime this summer. This is all good news for the people who live in Shell Bluff. Abby Boudreaux, CNN, Atlanta. Okay. So, how do you think that turned out? <laughs> yeah, that's right. She's in an ABC LA or whatever right now. Um, also, the woman who heads up the Department of Energy uh, Environmental Management, Dr. Inez Triai, who encouraged us for the first time in eight years. We've been fighting to get that monitoring back. It was cut in 2002, 2003. And she came down on her first uh, job down at the Savannah River site. She was an Obama appointee, President Obama. And she, we asked her about getting the monitoring back. She, when she found out we didn't have it, she said, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, radiation doesn't acknowledge state boundaries. You know, get it back. She's gone now. The industry is incredibly powerful. We have been working with senators in Washington. We go, we're part of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. This is a small amount of money we're talking about. 1.89 million was the last grant for three years. That is peanuts, $640,000, $30,000 to monitor the fish, the collards. What did they find out? This is the industry. Southern Company did not want this little pesky thing of monitoring because our monitoring in Georgia showed, because they also do it in South Carolina, our monitoring showed that eating collard greens three times, a big thing in the South, gave you the same radiological exposure as South Carolina said would take of eating them for a whole year. This, these are things, they, as Helen Caldicott to say, well, of course, Bobby, they don't want it because they know it's contaminated. This, this whole area is contaminated. So we're talking about the fish, the air, the rain, which is so important with tritium coming from this. This is DOE. This is federal. We're not saying it's coming from Vogel, but this is another thing. Um, on our website, I don't have time today, but we have, if you go to georgiawan.org, we have uh, a guide to nuclear power in Georgia. Pay attention when suddenly they want a $50,000 or something in, uh, to study nuclear power, and it seems very benign. That was the beginning in 2006 of their bringing back the nuclear renaissance, the ESP, the, uh, all of this happening up until their approval of the AP-1000, Toshiba Westinghouse, which is the end of this, their licensing and that design. We are fighting them still. In, in court, our new case since Fukushima, 
And I'll quickly go to here to tell you what's happened since Fukushima. Ooh, come on, there we go. Uh, Mr. Shoji Kihara from Hiroshima came to be with us because he felt it was more important to come to Burke County to be at Vogel and to stop Vogel than to speak to a thousand people on, um, okay, I'm clicking on it, and there you go, okay. This is, this was a, um, an event we had at March 11th, uh, 150 people came. This was the second time a busload had come to this church. And Mr. Shoji Kihara, there he is getting off the bus. Um, and we had a celebration, not a celebration. We had a remembrance of the day. The reactors are right behind us there on the stage. That's the map over there. I brought it since we had stars of each one of the reactors. You can check it for your accuracy. <laughs> um, and we had black and white, young and old. This woman was saying, oh, precious Lord, she's 90 years old and needs no mic. Um, playing together, reverence. That's one of the reverends we're honoring. Songs, poetry. There's Shoji with Janet Abraham talking about, he's writing his fourth book, and the last chapter of it's going to be on Georgia. He feels that if we can stop Vogel, we can stop Japan from turning back on the reactors. He talked about the summer and how they got through the summer. Um, I don't know whether you can see the little over the, this is about four miles from Vogel. How in the summer on the windows they grew beans up the window and how people survived very well without a lot of air conditioning. He was very um, hopeful and um, we are both activists in communities, and we became very, very, very close. And this is what I feel is happening here today, is that we have to take action. And um, to my dear new friend, um, Ryuko Moto, tomorrow this will be read in Atlanta, and it's the beginning of As We Are Anti-War, a Mother's Day peace proclamation. Mother's Day started as anti-war. Arise then, women of this day. Arise, all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have questions answered by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands will not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have taught them of charity, mercy, and patience. We, the women of one country, will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons or daughters to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of a devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword of murder is not the balance of justice. I hope that together we can work together to keep Japan from going back and that we ultimately can defeat Plant Vogel. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Jeff Patterson, who is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in Madison. Uh, and there he maintains an active family practice and teaches residents in family medicine. He's a board member of the group uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, or PSR, uh, and once served as, as the organization's president. PSR is the U.S. affiliate of the uh, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, uh, which was awarded the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Dr. Patterson has traveled extensively in the former USSR, visiting Chernobyl and sites of nuclear testing and nuclear weapons production, and has lectured about the effects of nuclear weapons and radiation in, in, Rus in the former uh, USSR, in Europe, and in the US. His special interests include the medical effects of radiation, nonviolent alternatives to war as a means of preventing war, and also sustainable methods of ameliorating climate change. Now let's welcome Dr. Patterson. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. It's uh, always great to be in Chicago, and it's especially good to see so many people here on a, a Saturday, uh, and young people as well. I really uh, appreciate that. I often think sometimes it's us gray-haired folks who are running this stuff, and so it's nice to see uh, young people here, and the gorillas. Are the gorillas still here? <laughs> they were great. And I'd like to thank our colleagues uh, from Japan for their very inspiring messages. Uh, it certainly drives me again to do more. And so thank you very, very much. I wanted to talk about uh, some of the health effects of radiation. Um, and I represent Physicians for Social Responsibility, affiliated with uh, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Uh, we're 50 years old. We started back in actually 1991 and 19, or, I'm sorry, 1961 and 62, and we published the first article on the medical consequences of thermonuclear war in 1962 in the New England Journal. And so we're celebrating that today, and we hope to have a follow-up article now, 50 years later. Uh, this was quite significant because the public really didn't know much about the effects of radiation uh, and the effects of nuclear weapons at that time. Thanks to the secrecy of the nuclear weapons establishment or the nuclear industrial complex that I'm going to talk about. And this really uh, projected that into the foreground and at that time we found that children's teeth had strontium-90 in them from nuclear testing and then uh, subsequently that led to to Kennedy and Khrushchev signing the above ground test ban treaty that put testing underground. PSR sort of went into hibernation along with uh, protesting and thinking about nuclear weapons until the late 70s, early 80s when Dr. Helen Caldicott came along and uh, rebirthed the organization and uh, has certainly been a stalwart um, soldier in this uh, thing that we've been dealing with, and I thought, too, when I joined at that time, we'd have it done by now, and uh, how little we knew. Huh? Um, so here we are today, and I think the uh, forces are even stronger than they've ever been in the nuclear industrial complex. There are three fundamental issues that I want to talk about today. One is there is no safe dose of radiation, and I'm going to talk about that and what happens medically uh, with radiation. Two is the nature of the nuclear industrial complex. It is really powerful worldwide. And three is what is the reality of radiation releases that we face today all the way from medical irradiation, which is probably the biggest source of radiation that we get, uh, to nuclear weapons, to nuclear power plants, to the entire nuclear fuel cycle. So first let's talk about the nuclear industrial complex. The nuclear industrial complex was born out of nuclear weapons. Intense secrecy around it. The Manhattan Project in this country, uh, the Soviets following suit not too long after that uh, in developing their nuclear weapons and then the blossoming of the Cold War uh, that ultimately led us to have 50,000 nuclear weapons in the world. We've now gotten rid of half of those and we've got a long ways to go. And then Eisenhower came along and developed the concept of the peaceful atom. And the peaceful atom was supposed to supply us with electricity that was too cheap to meter. We saw a slide uh, earlier uh, uh, about this. And uh, in, in fact, quite the opposite has happened. It's really too expensive to meter. And so the uh, nuclear industrial complex has to figure out all kinds of ways to hide the cost, uh, the real cost of that. And we're not going to talk much uh, about cost today. But nuclear weapons and nuclear power go hand in glove. One doesn't come without the other. And if we look at countries today that are pushing nuclear power, the United States, Britain, France, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, countries that are getting rid of nuclear power, Japan, Germany, Switzerland, Egypt, maybe. We'll see what happens with the new government there and uh, perhaps other countries. What's the difference? The countries who are pushing it all have nuclear weapons. All have nuclear weapons and uh, they're desperate to continue this. It goes hand in glove in many, many ways, uh, all the way from the fact that we are buying uh, highly enriched uranium from the Russians' weapons industry to run our nuclear power plants. 
And I had a uh, talk the other day, and a gentleman said, well, that, that's a good thing to get, use up that highly enriched uranium. Yes, on the one hand, that's true. But on the other hand, it really is taking costs away from the nuclear power industry as well. It's cheaper because it's already made. The stuff's already made. Um, and we look at India and Pakistan, both of who are non-signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and both who develop nuclear weapons out of their peaceful nuclear Adams program that we supplied, uh, both the training and the, um, the reactors and the light water, et cetera, for. And, you know, we put India on the bad list for a while. We wouldn't uh, cooperate with them, send them any more nuclear power plants. And now, because Westinghouse needs the money, we now sign a huge agreement with uh, India, and we're uh, once again supplying them with nuclear reactors, even though they won't let us into their weapons uh, complexes. So uh, there's tremendous hypocrisy here. Uh, and instead, we worry about Iran and we worry about North Korea, and granted, they are of concern. Uh, but how many of you know that North Korea shot a rocket off the other day? Okay, and it was a, a, you know, a, f a liquid fuel rocket, didn't work, didn't go anywhere. Why not? They may test another nuclear weapon soon. They may have two or three nuclear weapons. How many of you know that India shot a ballistic missile off the other day? Quite a difference, all right? And India shot a ballistic missile off that worked perfectly and is capable of hitting Beijing and other cities and, and may even be capable of coming uh, to the United States. Their ballistic missile program, despite the fact that they're non-signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, is fully capable of delivering nuclear weapons to Pakistan and other countries. And yet you didn't even hear about it wasn't even in the press. Here we are looking at North Korea with this little microscope, you know, oh, they're terrible, terrible. And yet we have this development of uh, a huge ballistic missile program and nuclear weapons program in India and Pakistan, which have come very close to nuclear war twice, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Well, I like to think of the, the downfall of the nuclear industrial complex uh, because they have three poisonous peas. These are the poisonous pills that they carry. One is price, and uh, as was mentioned, the, the cost of these plants is getting so astronomical that the, the former head of Exelon, who just retired recently, said three years ago, and then just shortly after retired, there's no future for nuclear energy because it's too expensive. Um, and then we hear about stocks being sold. Uh, we know where the money goes. Pollution, and we are going to talk about that quite a bit today, and then nuclear proliferation, which is tied in together with this. We cannot separate the two out. The hallmarks of the nuclear industrial complex are secrecy, and we've heard about some of that already, cover-up, and minimization. You keep it secret, you don't let it out, and that started in the roots of the development of the nuclear bomb back in the Manhattan Project, perhaps for good reasons, uh, and continued on, both the Russians and us, and it continues today, uh, both in the nuclear power and the nuclear weapons components of the nuclear industrial complex. If you can't keep it secret, then you cover it up, and we see that over and over again. Uh, this didn't in, in really a big problem. Uh, we put some dirt over it. Uh, Rocky Flats, for example, supposedly safe, and yet we know plutonium is still in that soil and still migrating in the water there. Um, and then if you can't cover it up, then you minimize it, okay? This leak is no harm to human health. How many times have you heard that over and over and over again, okay? Well, I think Jay Leno, and I don't know how many of you like Jay Leno anymore, but uh, Jay Leno probably uh, hit this right on the head uh, recently with this uh, vignette. Well, sometimes a little satire is uh, good for us in terms of pointing out the truth. Um, anyway, we've all heard this many, many times. You know, there was this leak, uh, but no harm to human health. No harm to human health. Well, we don't know that unless we watch the effects of this for years and years and years. So it's, it's a ludicrous statement. There is no safe dose of radiation. How do we know that? 
Well, David Lilienthal, who was the first head of the Atomic Energy Commission, now the NRC, said it's a great privilege to be alive at a time in the world's history when a discovery akin to finding fire electricity comes along. There used to be three R's that everyone had to learn, read and write and arithmetic, and to this we must now add a fourth R, radiation, and that's true. The Beer report, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, a huge government report that has several reports. Its last report in 2005 said low doses of radiation, there's a direct linear relationship between dose and development of solid tumors. There is no safe dose of radiation, even background radiation. And this is probably the, the best document. It's a thick document, a little nighttime reading if you have insomnia. Uh, and, uh, but it, it certainly has held up uh, well. Now you're gonna hear lots of counter arguments that low dose radiation is good for you. Hormesis is the thing, that it actually builds your immunity. And uh, we'll mention a couple things about that in a few minutes. But there is no safe dose of radiation. There's no free lunch. A single exposure is sufficient to increase cancer incidences years later. And we're seeing that in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki populations now where we're still seeing new cancers uh, at rates that ex exceed the normal population. And the radiation-induced cancer is indistinguishable from naturally-induced cancer. We can't tell which cancer comes from radiation and which comes from other mechanisms such as pollutants and other things in our environment. And most cancers are increased. We knew this fairly early on when we were looking at nuclear testing and we were doing things like this as marching soldiers down to ground zero and I've testified for soldiers who had this and developed cancer later on when the government was not uh, compensating them. Now they've passed compensation laws. And I know what these soldiers had in terms of monitoring their radiation and it was nothing. You know, maybe one guy in a whole platoon of soldiers would carry a Geiger counter, but nobody else was monitored. And the radiation does not go spread evenly. You know, there are hot spots, cold spots, it's in dust, uh, et cetera. And there was no internal monitoring of what they took in internally. We knew, of course, from the, our experiences in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we saw some startling pictures uh, this morning. Uh, the, uh, of, of the um, uh, effects of that. 100,000 people died immediately from blast. Uh, and people ask me all the time, well, gosh, they rebuilt Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Can't be that bad. Now, that's because the bombs were exploded about 1,000 feet in the air. And so this was a one-time dose of X-rays and neutrons, uh, the gamma rays, actually, and neutrons, uh, like getting a big X-ray. There was very little fallout. There was some black rain, and we don't really know how much radiation was in that, but it really was a one-time huge X-ray that these people had. So we've been studying these folks since that time or sometime after that. I last heard the cost of that study uh, when I was at a radiation conference in the Ukraine after uh, Chernobyl. And the cost at that time, which was about 15, 20 years ago, uh, was 3.8 billion, B with a B, dollars for that study. And so I'm sure by now and in today's dollars, it's probably five or six billion dollars just to do those studies, okay? Lots of complex stuff they did. We went on and we learned more when we exploded nuclear weapons uh, in many sites, including the um, Bikini Atoll. This is uh, Castle Bravo, a hydrogen test. And unfortunately, at that time in the Bikini Atoll, there were uh, fishermen from Japan uh, on the Lucky Dragon, uh, a, fish that was, a fishing ship that was in the area. And the pulverized coral came up. And you can also see in this slide ships that were down here. And they tried to decontaminate those ships with high steam blasting. And they couldn't decontaminate it. They finally sunk the things. Uh, so I don't have ho much hope for decontaminating Japan, just like Chernobyl uh, today. So. Um, the coral was pulverized in this and it blew then downwind uh, and it blew over the Lucky Dragon, which was a, a fishing ship. Uh, the fishermen went out and it came down for three hours and they were scooping this coral, radioactive coral, with their hands and throwing it overboard. And uh, they didn't know what it was. And then they developed radiation sickness uh, after this. So here comes the lying about this. So the chairman of the AEC at that time, uh, Richard, uh, Robert Strauss, uh, said that these injuries they had, the radiation injuries, were from the abrasiveness of the coral and not from radiation. And then the story developed. He told Eisenhower's press advisor, who announced it to the public, that the communists from Russia had taken over this ship, and they were there spying on our nuclear weapons uh, program. And so this was uh, the reason they were there, and they shouldn't have been there. 
Uh, so these are the kinds of, again, lies and cover-up that are so characteristic of the nuclear industry and have been uh, throughout and continue today. Well, in addition, children on Rongelap, one of the islands in the Marshall Islands, were out playing in this snow that was coming down. They'd never seen snow. They thought this was snow. And so they got tremendous doses of radiation as this young man who came to Bethesda had his thyroid checked like many of the young children in uh, Japan are getting today, their thyroids checked. Well, unfortunately, he died two years later of leukemia, uh, I'm sure from this radiation, very small population of people. Well, what's happened in the Bikini Atoll? We, now, we know what it's like to clean places up or not clean them up because we've had experience with this, with these bombings. So we look in 1985 here, and uh, this uh, Bikini Atoll explosion was 1954. So we're 30 years later, and they, the islanders wanted to move back. So they scraped 17 inches of topsoil off, and then they planted plants there to see what would grow. And you can see the pumpkin uh, in his right, um, left hand there, normal pumpkin, good jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, and you can see the deformed pumpkin grown in that pumpkin patch in the Bikini Atoll 30 years after that explosion. And you see the spike on the spectrophotometer, that's cesium in that pumpkin. And you also see that he has a lead-lined glove on that he's holding that pumpkin with. Right. So we know, we've known for a long time, the government has kept this secret in many, many ways. So what do we think about the low-level effects of radiation? We know a lot about it, and the, a lot of arguments back and forth, and I'll talk about a couple of those studies uh, in, a, in a minute. Dr. Alice Stewart, uh, a brilliant epidemiologist, general practitioner, and then moved into epidemiology in England. She studied x-rays on fetuses and did uh, great epidemiological work. She was a wonderful woman. Uh, I had her to Madison several times and visited her in England as well. And Alice discovered that one x-ray of a fetus in utero, and the fetuses are much more sensitive to radiation as are women than are adult males, which are all the standards that we talk about. You know, you're, you can get 20 millisieverts or whatever. Uh, those are, that's aimed for adult males. It has nothing to do with fetuses and children and women. All right? Women are twice as sensitive as men to radiation, much more breast cancer especially. So Alice found that one x-ray in utero would cause, uh, would increase the incidence of leukemia uh, on that baby by one and a half times. Now, when I started practice, longer ago than I care to remember, uh, and I've done a lot of deliveries, at that time we would do x-ray pelvimetry on women. They'd come in in labor and having a hard time, and so we'd say, oh, get some pelvimetry. My partner Mary probably did many of these uh, pelvimetries back in her day as an x-ray tech. And so it was a large dose of radiation right to the pelvis, right to this fetus. Worthless x-rays really told us nothing about could this baby really fit through the pelvis. And we still do those same types of things with other studies today that I'll talk about if you wish in the panel. Um, and so here were women getting routine. How many x-rays do you do with pelvimetry routinely? Two or three uh, x-rays right to the pelvis, um, and so these babies were getting this. Medicine, uh, medical x-rays are probably the biggest source of radiation for all of us uh, in the United States and maybe some other countries, not in developed countries, not in underdeveloped countries. One individual in a thousand will develop cancer from a 10 millisievert exposure with a CAT scan. I had a lady in the other day uh, with irritable bowel syndrome, 38 years old, something like that, and I looked through her chart, and in my electronic records, I could see she'd had eight abdominal CAT scans. Every time she'd go to the ER with abdominal pain, she gets a CAT scan. Every one of them was normal. And she said, well, I've been to Iowa and Minnesota, and I've been to hospitals there, and I've had CAT scans there as well. I said, you need to stop having CAT scans, okay? tremendous dose of radiation and increases her chances because radiation doses are cumulative. It's not like you just get this x-ray and then you're fine. It's like it accumulates time after time after time. Okay. Um, so, but it doesn't just happen that way. It's leakage of radiation is happening throughout the nuclear fuel cycle. From the time we dig it up out of the ground, the uranium mining, 
converting it, in, which takes a lot of electricity, a lot of water uh, for the mining and whatnot, enriching it, conversion to fuel, the diversion to nuclear weapons, uh, like Rocky Flats, where we uh, have contamination with plutonium and uh, other elements years later, into reactors, leaks from reactors, big leaks, little leaks, you know, that little leak that uh, is no harm to human health. But again, it accumulates time after time after time. How many of you have any idea how many x-rays you've had in your life? I'm a doctor. Some of you may, because you may not have had a lot of them. Is that correct? All right. Uh, you know, I've had enough and more than enough, you know, dental x-rays, et cetera. And uh, two recent studies about that. One was in women with um, dental x-rays. They had lap shields on. They got dental x-rays early in pregnancy, many of them before they even knew they were pregnant. And they had lower birth weight infants than women who did not get dental x-rays. Okay? And we think it's because of the x-ray to the woman's thyroid affecting the thyroid and the growth of the fetus. Good study. And then a second study that just came out uh, a month ago uh, looking at dental x-rays and the incidence of meningiomas, which is a benign uh, intracranial tumor, uh, and showing a higher incidence of meningiomas in people who get more dental x-rays. So, you know, even that, which my dentist assures me is just fine, no problem, uh, and, uh, but it all adds up every time you get it. And so in addition to that, you get this exposure throughout the nuclear fuel cycle and finally to the waste storage, which we have no idea what to do with the waste. And believe you me, France doesn't, Norway doesn't. Norway's trying to build a big repository and a granite uh, uh, mountain. Uh, nobody has the answer to this, and I don't know that we will. So looking at the mining uh, in this country, uranium was mined, and most of these things, like in Australia, in India, uh, my colleague was just telling me that he goes to India and measures uh, radiation levels in the mining industry in India. Um, and they're in, 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 in indigenous areas. So many of the miners were uh, Indians down in Arizona. This is a venting of a mine, blowing the air out of the mine, because we know there are high levels of radon, radon in these mines, like there are in some basements, uh, and it has to have a fan to blow it out. Well, the nuclear industry fought for years to prevent having to vent these mines, because it would add the cost of about a dollar to a ton of uranium. And then finally, Congress got enough pressure and they passed a law that they had to vent these mines. So this mine is being vented in near a schoolyard. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing that happens. Tailings, tons and tons of ground up rock, the uranium's extracted from, but this is still radioactive. And so huge mountains of it that we have no idea what to do with. Animals burrow in it, it erodes. Uh, Rio Puerco was an incident in Arizona where a state-of-the-art dam that was holding a tailings pond, the water that they used to wash this stuff out with, uh, broke and ran down the Rio Puerco River and contaminated it. And animals and people were taking water out of the river. Um, have we followed up any of that? No. So it goes through the environment and it accumulates and it moves up the food chain. And it moves up the food chain to us. We are at the top of the food chain through the grass, through the cows, through the milk. You know, when Chernobyl went up, we had radioactive milk. We had radioactive iodine in our milk in Wisconsin. Um, did we do anything about it? No, didn't hand out iodine to kids. We didn't do anything about it. Uh, I was in uh, Germany, in Marburg, Germany, shortly after uh, Chernobyl went up, doing a speaking tour in East and West Germany, which was an interesting experience, because in West Germany, people were talking about it. In East Germany, nobody knew anything about it. Uh, and um, so anyway, the mayor of Marburg came up to me after my talk and he said, what should I tell my people? He said, I, I don't know uh, what to say. The, the next county over, they got the cows out in the fields. We've told our farmers to keep the cows indoors because of the radioactive iodine. And he said, my nuclear people tell me one thing, it's not a big deal, don't worry about it. My medical people tell me another. Some of the activists tell me another. I don't know what to say. And he said, we've measured on sidewalks where there won't be much radiation. Then we come to a puddle, and there's very high radiation in the puddle. Now, I think about it, and I think, gosh, little kids, what do they do? They come and they jump in puddles, don't they? 
And so kids get this. They're also closer to the ground, and so they get more exposure this way. And they're more sensitive to radiation. All of this stuff that we just don't even think about as we do this. Well, it moves up the food chain, and we're currently seeing that. One of the uh, slides this morning talked about the worldwide level of cesium at three micro, microsieverts uh, per um, kilogram, I think, was the level. Anyway, from nuclear testing. But it's a bit deceiving because, uh, and then five uh, in some areas, and then Chernobyl raised that, obviously. A bit deceiving because we may generally have that level, but... For example, in Germany and France, you kill a wild boar, you have to have it tested for radiation because wild boars eat funguses, they eat mushrooms, truffles and things. And so they accumulate more radiation. So many of the wild boars that are shot in those countries have to be disposed of as nuclear waste. In England, there are still sheep farms 26 years after Chernobyl where they can't eat the meat of the sheep because there's so much cesium because they're eating the grass that's concentrating the cesium and bringing it up. So it doesn't matter what the general level is, you're seeing this concentration up the food chain, and again, we are at the top of the food chain, and our kids are. And there are lots of isotopes. It's not just cesium. The I-131 is the, uh, for thyroid we worry about. And when you think about the half-life of this, eight days, you really have to take that times 10 to get it down to a level where you don't have to worry about it anymore. Strontium, cesium, plutonium that lasts a long, much, much longer. Natural disasters have a beginning and a middle and an end. This is quite different from radiation. Radiation contaminates, it befouls, it penetrates, pollutes, unseen and silent. You can't smell it, you can't feel it, and it frightens in new and special ways. And that dread lingers on and on and on. So a number of radiation disasters in the world. The nuclear explosions that we conducted uh, in the atmosphere for many, many years. Kishtim, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima. Kishtim, a storage tank exploded, hydrogen explosion. 217 villages were destroyed. 10,000 people evacuated over two years. So many of those people were exposed to a lot of radiation. CIA knew about it. They kept it a secret, that secrecy thing. This is... Uh, Hanford, and these are storage tanks much like the one in Russia that exploded. Radiation cloud moved 350 kilometers, contaminated 800 square kilometers, and it's still off limits today. This was 1957 that, that this happened. And I drove through there. We went up to Chelyabinsk to look at the nuclear weapons uh, industry there, and there were these beautiful trees, looked like northern Wisconsin, with signs on them that said, don't come in these woods, it's too radioactive here. And then you'd drive along and there'd be a field with stuff planted. And I said to the guide, how can they plant crops there when the woods are too radioactive for anybody to enter? The animals don't read the signs, of course. Uh, he said, oh, we have to eat, so we grow the crops here and we ship them to other areas and we do, do, mix the crops together and dilute it down that way. <laughs> we laugh, but that's happening in the Ukraine, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts. If I were Mitt Romney, I'd bet somebody $10,000, but uh, that, that's probably happening in Japan today, the same thing. When we look at the uh, cloud of cesium that came out of um, Chernobyl, it doesn't spread evenly, and it, depending on how the wind blows, and this is true of the uh, Japanese stuff too, it, it's like this sort of evil undulating wave that moves all around and deposits different, different amounts of cesium in different places. It was picked up in Sweden first because nuclear power plant workers coming out of the or into the plants were setting off the alarms because they had, they had radiation on them from the atmosphere rather than anything they picked up in the plant. And fortunately, uh, thanks to uh, heroic efforts in, uh, in Chernobyl, this was covered up and stopped ultimately. But it went worldwide. They had to dig up lots and lots of soil. Uh, this is sand around the plant. I visited hospital number six a month after the uh, accident. This was an engineer who subsequently died. His blood count was near zero at this point. He's bronze because of liver failure. Uh, burns on his legs from radiation wafting up his legs. Another patient we saw, a fireman, with the, these are radiation burns on his leg and they were in life tents. Many of them received uh, bone marrow transplants. Uh, Bob Gale went over there, a surgeon. Armand Hammer flew him over, big to-do about it. 
In a radiation conference that I was at in the Ukraine, they said that they felt that the men who received radi bone marrow transplants actually did worse than the other patients did. So we really can't help these people in this situation. A lot of conflicting data about how many deaths have occurred from this. Uh, the WHA, 56 death, uh, maybe 4,000 eventually, uh, all the way up to estimates of a million deaths already. We're not following the 800 thousand liquidators who went in there and cleaned the thing up. Some interesting stories about that. Chernobyl today is still a mess, and the levels of strontium in the soil have dropped off as we predicted 26 years later. The levels of cesium in the soil have stayed the same, and in some areas gotten higher. We don't know why, what's happening. These trees are trees that the inner part, of course, was prior to the Chernobyl accident. The outer rings are post-Chernobyl. So we're often very arrogant in when we talk about human effects of this, what it does to us. What is it doing to the ecosystem at the same time? So a very recent study on Chernobyl barn swallows, very good study, uh, just published uh, two weeks ago. And it showed that the reduced adult population by 43% in barn swallows. Barn swallows don't migrate. They stay in the same place. So they looked at yearling barn swallows, which is when they mate. And they found that male, males were reduced by 24%, but females were reduced by 57%. You remember I said that females are much more sensitive to radiation, and it applies to barn swallows as well. So they estimated from the pollution in the area that there was an excess annual mortality of about 1.8 million birds annually. And this is going to happen in Fukushima. It's going to happen everywhere where this is going on. This is an excellent study. I, 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 invite you to read it. So they built a huge sarcophagus. Here you can see me standing in front of the plant. Now they're having to build another one over it at the cost of $16 billion or $18 billion. This one's supposed to last for 100 years. We'll see who's going to replace it in 100 years. Then Fukushima happened. Beautiful plant right on the ocean. And here you can see the wave coming in. There's the tidal wave coming in. These are the generators. And here you see the water coming into the generators. And that shut the plant down, shut off the cooling systems. As a result, we had the explosions. This one looks quite different from this one. And maybe we can discuss that in the panel a bit in terms of what that might mean. This one looks more like a steam explosion. This one looks more like a much bigger explosion. That's the second one. Plant was devastated. These are the cooling rods that we were talking about in uh, the reactor. And they're packed in there tight. And so it may be that some of them gotten bent or damaged. It's going to be hard to get them out of there. We don't know how to get them out. And that's going to be a huge job in addition to getting into the reactors themselves, which have certainly melted through. Nuclear power plants in the US, 104 of them. Uh, 11 in Illinois. 11, Illinois has more than any other state. And we have lots of these fuel pools like this. And they look just like this. They don't have any covers, no containment vessel on them. I think they're an ideal uh, target for terrorists, frankly, because it would be much easier to hit them than it would be to hit the containment vessel where the reactor is. And they have much, much more pollution in them. If the water goes at them, the rods heat, and they catch on fire. Then that smoke goes up into the stratosphere and hurts us all. But the single biggest danger, that's the power arm of the nuclear industrial complex, is nuclear weapons. And that threat is bigger than ever. Despite the fact that we're decreased in numbers of weapons, uh, the Cold War sort of still goes on. Russia the other day threatening to attack our uh, ballistic missile stuff in Europe. But we just released a paper in PSR, go to our website and look at it, on a limited nuclear war of 100 weapons between India and Pakistan, and they have about 200, 280 weapons between them. Where, and they came very close to this in 2000 and 2006, twice. And uh, 100 weapons would create smoke that would go up into the stratosphere and circle the globe in four to five days. And it would create a global cooling then, a sudden drop in temperature. It's the answer to global warming, I guess. And that smoke would stay in the upper atmosphere up for up to 10 years. And it would create freezing temperatures uh, in the northern hemisphere all year round for up to 10 years. Agriculture would collapse, and we estimate over a billion people would starve to death. Many other ramifications of this, obviously, in terms of what would happen to society. 
And yet we have 20,000 nuclear weapons with the equivalent force of over 200,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. 10 billion tons of TNT, two tons for every human on the planet. And thousands of them remain on hair trigger alert. The president has this guy walking around with him with the suitcase all the time that's made by Halliburton, by the way. And, uh, you know, in the event of a nuclear attack or a rocket launched, as Yeltsin found out uh, in uh, a warm day in, uh, in November one year, and they, they saw a rocket coming out of Norway and the command system in, in Russia alerted Yeltsin that there was this unknown rocket, maybe an attack. We're told that he actually opened the suitcase uh, and they have a, a little card of codes, at least our president does. You know, if you want to launch three missiles, press this button. If you want a full-scale attack, press this button. It's just that simple because you've got 12 minutes to make this decision. So we don't know why Yeltsin didn't do it, uh, but he didn't, and it turned out this was a weather satellite being launched, and we had told the Russians we were going to do this, but it somehow didn't filter up the system, communications again. So here we are with our president, with his finger literally on the button, able to destroy civilization through global cooling or all of the nuclear war. One Trident submarine has more weapons power on it than India and Pakistan have, and yet we did this scenario with India and Pakistan. That's the, the sort of Damocles that we're living under as part of the nuclear industrial complex. And we should all be very, very concerned about this as the nuclear weapons establishment gets refurbished, new plants being built, new bombs being made. Uh, we're in a horrible situation here. And we have to change it. We can prevent nuclear war. We have to do it. And the way we do it is to get rid of all nuclear weapons. That's our goal. So remember the hallmark of the nuclear industrial complex, secrecy, cover-up, and minimization. As you look at what's happening in Fukushima now, because that's what the Japanese government does, because they're in bed with the nuclear industrial complex. It's what our government does. does. It's what the Russians do. And you can be sure the Chinese and Indian, Indians and Pakistanis are doing that, and certainly the Israelis. Uh, that's the characteristics of this. Don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. Don't get into arguments about a little release of radiation or this uh, small dose or what it does because that's the tree and you can get totally bound up in that in arguments with people. The forest is that we are blanketing the earth with unknown amounts of radiation multiple times over and over again that's gonna go on for centuries to come. We're doing this with an uh, unknowing an unconsenting population worldwide, we're all being affected by it, whether it be from bombing, from leakage, from accidents, from waste, or from the medical community, this is the reality of what's happening with, with us in radiation today. And so we all have to learn more about it uh, and stop this process by closing down nuclear power plants and by getting rid of nuclear weapons. We're not going to know the results of this experiment that we're conducting today, which I think is unconscionable at best, for centuries to come. Our children and grandchildren and their children are going to inherit this from us. It's an awful, awful legacy that we're leaving them. So we're at a fork in the road, maybe past the fork, I don't know. Uh, Einstein said the splitting of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Educate yourselves. Uh, Dave's organization, the NEIS, and other organizations, great groups to join and read about, and become active. Uh, the only thing you cannot do is nothing. Thank you very much. We have a beautiful planet. Um, thank you, Dr. Patterson. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the, uh, our next speakers, um, Nancy Faust and Dean Wilkie. Um, they're both here today to speak about a, uh, their involvement in the website simplyinfo.org, uh, which evolved out of a live blog uh, that was run by Reuters in the immediate aftermath of the 311 tragedy. Uh, when the blog was dropped by Reuters, um, Nancy and Dean and, and other leaders of the group worked to continue to help uh, the site continue its online existence as a unique nonprofit and international crowdsourced approach to news dissemination and investigative research. 
Um, and the group has continued to follow the 311 disaster with a particular focus on the nuclear accident, uh, using the knowledge of its members for research and analysis of both the technical and humanitarian aspects of the tragedy. Um, I'll go ahead and in introduce both of them and then uh, they'll each speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, Nancy led the technical team in the planning and creating of the, of the website and information systems and has over 15 years experience in the design and production of online media due to her work in the advertising industry. Um, Dean Wilkie has three decades of experience in the nuclear field where he's, uh, through his, particularly through his work at the Department of Energy, uh, test the, 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 the DOE test reactor in Idaho. And while he was there, he worked in reactor operations and held various positions from reactor operator to plant management. He also worked in construction and plant engineering and played an instrumental role in coordination of work uh, performed to support the reactor. So with that, I'll hand over the floor to Nancy. Thank you. Hi. My name is Nancy Faust, and I'm from simplyinfo.org. My involvement with the Fukushima nuclear disaster and with Simply Info was quite by chance. Like many of our group's members, I was compelled to investigate the disaster. The tragedy we saw unfolding impacted so many lives and the magnitude of the disaster was just too much to ignore. My background is in technology and communications. Like many of our members, we came from diverse places to work together. SimplyInfo.org is a public crowdsourced expert intelligence gathering and evaluation service for nuclear and related issues. Our strength is in our diversity. People from around the globe from varied professions and industries have come together to research, investigate, analyze, and educate. Oh, how did the group form and why did we do it? We formed off of the Reuters Live blog that was covering the 311 disaster. Uh, people were trying to find out more information than Reuters was giving out on the blog and because it had the ability to ask questions without moderation, it just kind of organically grew into an open conversation. Um, there was a lot of misinformation and a lack of information that was rampant. Uh, timely and factual information were very hard to find. Uh, the actual situation at the plant was not being told. Authorities and the media downplayed the situation. Many conflicting and confusing statements were coming out. Some people claimed the accident could not happen at Fukushima as the accident was beginning to unfold and become undeniable. There were still claims of totally safe right up until Unit 1 exploded. Then those people disappeared. <laughs> people in Japan wanted information as they were not get, getting any on the risks, the real situation at the plant, radiation levels, or basic protection tactics. And many of them began to show up in the writer's live blog. Uh, our team efforts quickly found data and answers. More hands made faster work, and we frequently found information faster than the media did. Having people in Japan asking us for help to make very life-changing decisions was sobering. People outside Japan also wanted information about real situa the real situation and potential for risk outside of Japan. People worried for those in the midst of the disaster and many had family in Japan. Uh, we struggled to find credible sources of information in the media, so we sought them out. We looked for factual information, uh, direct resources, could we find radiation readings, those kinds of things. Um, these were some of the catalysts for forming the group. People felt like we needed to do something. Some of the key things we have done. Our research kept us ahead of the government and TEPCO's <laughs> admissions about the plant status. We frequently determined issues at the plant weeks or months before they were publicly admitted. We, dro we dove deeper into technical questions and gathered critical reactor and plant data to monitor and find anomalies in Fukushima. Photo and video forensics were done to extract additional data about the reactors. We ga this gave us critical information on damage, meltdowns, and the blasts. We vetted research news and expert statements to the media for factual accuracy while attempting to remain fact-focused and unbiased. We gathered a large body of information as an unbiased historical record of the disaster. We hope it was, and what we continue to collect, is of use for future research efforts to, for others. Compiling this information into a larger information collection of documents, data, and imagery is our ongoing goal. Our team-based research compiles news and information into one location. The work we generate includes citing our sources as an effort to bridge the gap between the immediate media journalism and the slower-generated academic works. 
some of the key things we found. Unit one experiences earthquake decorium effect. What this was is when an earthquake of a 6.0 or higher, it would frequently cause significant increases in radiation readings in the dry well of Unit 1. Uh, this included some increases as high as 57 sieverts an hour over a period of a short few hours. Uh, we found a ground fissure at Unit 1 that ran up to the building in a photograph one of our members found. Uh, it showed this deep hole in the ground that ran right up to Unit 1, and we also have pictures of where they later filled it in. Unit 1's rapid meltdown and the extent that certain uh, failure points played in the system's demise, as far as uh, the isolation condenser shutdowns, uh, how the station blackout wasn't anticipated in many of the manuals and conflicting information that had been given to the workers in manuals. Uh, Unit 3's explosion may have been a combination of a hydrogen explosion and an ex-vessel steam explosion. There's been a lot of debate about what happened with Unit 3. Um, a number of our members have looked into it, and they feel that it was a hydrogen explosion and then followed by what's called an ex-vessel steam explosion where there's an actual steam, you know, like if you had a pressure cooker and it got too much pressure in it and blew out the top. Uh, Unit 3's MOX fuel uh, may have caused some confounding issues. In our research, we found issues with uh, fuel vaporizing at low temperatures, hot spots that can be created because of inconsistencies in the milling process for the fuel, uh, and existing damage that it was found in the storage of the MOX unit or the MOX assemblies at Fukushima. Um, we also found uh, Unit 4's spent fuel pool instability. Workers confirmed to us directly that Unit 4 spent fuel pool was of great concern in April of 2011 and that work was being prepared to support the, spool, the pool structure as a priority. TEPCO didn't admit this publicly for months. Unit 4's fuel pool will continue to be a risk until it is emptied due to the structural integrity issues and fuel corrosion. Challenges we experienced in addressing the disaster. Uh, language was an issue, documents were frequently in Japanese only, and there was a difficulty communicating with witnesses and victims, and of course finding translators was always a challenge. Fear and intimidation tactics by the government happened frequently. There was a harmful rumor law in Japan that was instituted after the disaster. This had a chilling effect on participation in our group. Uh, we had a number of people in Japan as contributors who stopped contributing after that law was made public out of fear of retaliation or arrest. Uh, many other members have mentioned harassment in varying types outside of Japan also. Uh, attempts to frame the debate, downplay the situation, or inject misinformation by government and industry has made finding accurate information more difficult or time consuming as people had to uh, dig through Con confusing information, inaccurate information to find what the true facts were. Some things that stuck in our minds. Um, as we were going through the early days of trying to figure out what was going on in Japan, uh, these are some things that members had said really stuck out in their heads. Uh, people online who were trying to figure out if they should evacuate, find or take iodine pills, or just simply trying to find an evacuation route, and they were asking online. Images of the tsunami, uh, the massive disaster, and Unit 3 exploding, those visuals are things people mentioned that really stuck in their heads over the months. Uh, photos of people, uh, the worried face of a young mother, a woman crying in the rubble. Another one was uh, some members of SafeCast, which is a, a citizen's uh, radiation detecting group. And they were standing outside of a restaurant and talking to some older locals and showing them the Geiger counter and how high the radiation was in the parking lot of this restaurant. And these people were just, they had no idea that the radiation where they were standing was so high until someone from SafeCast showed them. Um, some things we found about the government response and risk. And the government and TEPCO uh, gave over optimistic reports, vague information, and conflicting information in an effort to protect their personal interests. Uh, the, this caused great anxiety and indecision for people directly impacted by the disaster. What was a concern about evacuating and safety measures is now turned into anxiety and indecision about the ability to return home and people's unknown health status. People everywhere still struggle with what to believe as they hear such differing information about safety and risk. The lack of timely and honest information caused some to be exposed unnecessarily and took away the ability for people to make their own decisions due to the lack of information. 
Government responses continue to make aspects of this disaster worse, such as the food supply concerns and a lack of uh, health testing. Status at the plant is still somewhat temporary and unstable. Further building damage or fuel changes could cause considerable problems, yet the government is discussing returning home and reactor restarts. Public reporting has been scaled back. This results in less factual information available for people to use. And, and finally, where Simply Info is now and where we want to be in the future. Uh, we developed a lean organizational and technical structure that allowed us to quickly evolve over the last 13 months. The live blog, which has been operational in some form since March 11, 2011, and that continues today. Our website launched in May of 2011 and has about 260,000 total page views with up to 10,000 views per day. The live blog has logged thousands of attendees at a time during the early months of the disaster. Our work has been picked up by media outlets and prominent nuclear activists. The disaster will be decades long and may outlive many of us. We are attempting to keep a detailed history and archive that will benefit researchers and those who need to understand the problem later on. We want to keep an honest historical record available to the public worldwide, and much of this is a work in progress. The ability to engage diverse people in research and information sharing creates new ways to approach challenges and understand issues. There's value in citizen-based news. The engagement, understanding, and participation puts people in an active role instead of a passive role. This empowers people to share that new knowledge among their circles and may turn many into lifelong activists. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dean Wilkie from simplyinfo.org. Uh, today has been particularly emotional for me in many ways. Uh, I'll share a couple of those that I hadn't planned on talking about. I'm a disabled Vietnam veteran, and I went through the war in Vietnam. And um, during that war, I saw some things that I've had to live with for my entire life. And so I know that during war, uh, horrific things happen to people. And today, we saw some of those images from a war that happened a long time ago, before I went to war. I'd like to start today by offering my deepest condolences to the people of Japan who have lost loved ones in the aftermath of three tragic disasters which occurred in 3-11-2011. I'd also like to thank Dr. Norma Field for the opportunity to be part of this symposium, and I am also honored to be here with the members of this uh, symposium and share some of my thoughts on post-Fukushima reactor events. My career spanned over 35 years as a reactor operator, as a supervisor, and as a manager of a nuclear facility for the Department of Energy. I know how to shut down a reactor, and I know how to keep the reactor safely shut down. During my career, which spanned over 35 years, I personally committed myself to the safe and responsible operation of the reactor that I was running. I learned the systems. I knew the systems inside and out. I used to challenge myself to go down in the middle of the basement and find valve 32 blindfolded. And when I became a supervisor, I instilled that same knowledge into the people that I worked with because I wanted them to know how to understand the plant, not by a procedure, but by their knowledge base. So those were the models that I used when I was in my career in reactor operations. When I became a manager of the reactor facility, I had to deal with the very smart people who were the designers, who did the analyses to tell me that from their analysis that the reactor would be safe. And many times I had to tell them, go back to the drying boards, because I don't like what I'm seeing. And so that's how I built my career. I was successful in my career. Uh, I've since retired from that, and I look back and see that my career was something that I poured myself into to make sure that I was running the reactor safely. 
And I think in today's environment, we have to not forget the reactor operators. We come from different size, but in the middle is the reactor operators. So we can't forget them. They're not going to work with the intent of having Fukushima happen. No one is, but we have to keep a strong vigilance if the reactors are going to continue to operate around the world. And we have to make sure that we have a voice for the operators because they need all the help they can get to understand the complexities of what they're dealing with and we need to give them every tool to be able to operate the reactor safely. I watched um, the Fukushima events unfold before my eyes as I was in this blog room with the, the people that came together and I couldn't believe my eyes. I knew about accidents and I knew about loss of coolant accidents. And so it made me think back as an operator and I tried to envision what I would have done in the, in the same situation with the people that were there on my shift in the reactor building. How would I react to the conditions? How could I have tried to do something different to help out? And how would I have protected the people that worked for me to get them out of the facility and out of danger? And I watched as the worst accidents imaginable unfolded the Fukushima Daiichi plants. The devastation was unbelievable. And it showed the kind of damage severe compounding accidents can have on a reactor facility. I decided when I joined the blog that I was going to stay committed. And when I first went in, uh, I was searching for some place to get information about the earthquake. But as I was going through, all of a sudden, the word of the tsunami came. And my emotions started springing up. The same way they did on 9-1-1 when the airplanes crashed into the World Trade Center. So inside me was this welling up of something that was going to happen that was going to be uh, horrific. And so I felt compelled to stay for four main reasons. The first one is to do what I could to help provide information about nuclear questions. And there were thousands of nuclear questions that were coming in. To help in the humanitarian efforts by adding to the collective knowledge of the group, our input was critical to the people that were in there visiting Many times there were 50,000 people in that blog. I was kind of focused on doing nuclear things, but all of a sudden I realized that what I said would make a difference for a Japanese family who was ready to try and make some decision on how to get their family out to a safe area. And Nancy pointed out that uh, oftentimes we would do whatever we could using whatever media source we could get Google Earth anything to get a map of the direction to get out to find safety because the routes were all blocked, the communications were down, and the people just really didn't know what to do or where to go. The uh, third thing was what you're looking at right now. I was touched with compassion to see so many children's lives being changed by something they did not understand. When I started seeing these things, I'm a grandparent. I have grandchildren. And it touched me emotionally, and I decided that I was going to stay on for the children to try and do what I could to get the help that they needed out, and I believe that we all felt that same way. It was a very sobering feeling for all of us in the room. Reuters sent a message out to some of the people that were in this room, and they asked us if we'd stay on, because they could see that we were trying to help educate from nuclear, help out in humanitarian efforts, and so we told them that we would. Members of our group have grown very, cl very close, and we've never seen each other. We've never talked to each other on the phone. Today, this morning, was the first time that I ever met Nancy. And Nancy and I have been in the blog for 14 months. 
around the clock, doing what we do. We have a team of people that are around the world, doctors, professional people, people that know how to build web pages that become interested in nuclear things and how to help. When I asked Dr. Field what her expectations were, she told me that she wanted to make sure that people in this symposium in the world did not forget that Japan has not been forgotten. Fukushima has not been forgotten. There's an expression in Japan that goes, once you've swallowed the food, you forget its heat. Meaning we tend to forget bad or dangerous times once they're past. From my experience, my knowledge base over the past year, I can tell you that Fukushima is not a forgotten problem. I tried to look at three different areas, the first of which is global issues with nuclear energy and nuclear power. 16 countries paused for a review and revisions to their regulations. 19 countries stopped or are opposed to nuclear power. Germany was one of the first countries to take that lead. Three countries paused construction for a review of Fukushima and then resumed construction of their reactors. And I might add that as of this morning, there's another country that's added shutting down their nuclear power plants. There were um, increased anti-nuclear sentiment around the world. We've all seen that. We've been part of that. And it's been evident in nine countries, and I believe that it is growing around the globe. The next area, let's see. The next area is the World Health Organization and humanitarian efforts. The International Atomic Energy Association said that the Japanese nuclear disaster caused deep public anxiety throughout the world and damaged confidence in nuclear power. They also said that there's a strong sense of lack of control over their own lives after a nuclear accident. And we've seen that. How can their lives have anything when an accident like this has happened? Russian doctors said that the Chernobyl survivors were poisoned by information. In Japan, Fukushima survivors may be contaminated by uncertainty. 116 countries, 28 international organizations, and 930,000 people have assisted Japan and have given over 520 billion yen. And I'm sure that that assistance is going to continue to increase, in part because I believe that the government of Japan is going to allow people to come in and help. That's my hope, that they will do that. The next thing is who is responsible for global nuclear energy policy and regulation? Our group believes that there's a lack of, of uniformity in nuclear energy and accident management education. And we've all heard different parts of that today. We believe that the lack, there's a lack of uniformity in international emergency preparedness. And that goes across the board for accidents that involve nuclear and non-nuclear. It seems like we go and all of a sudden we get complacent in the industry. And when something happens, we don't know what to do. It's chaos. And so I believe, and so does the group, that we need to make a lot of progress in that area. The United Nations called for accelerated efforts to strengthen the capacity to withstand disasters across the world. And disasters could mean anything. Any disaster in areas where you think they may never happen, like earthquakes of the size that we saw, like floods in the United States in this country that occurred 
as a result of high water years where there was flooding and a reactor was trying to be protected by having a rubber bladder around the reactor to keep water from coming in and having similar things happen. One thing I believe that the earth is telling us is it's telling us something needs to change, something's wrong. And these are the signs that the earth uses to tell us this. They're natural events, nothing that we plan, but something that we have to get a hold of and find out what we need to do as a society. In the United States, we had the Blue Ribbon Commission that we've all heard about, and they had eight key elements for citizens and policymakers. It's pretty easy for a government organization to come together and call in some people that are experts and come out with some information that we need to try and filter down into our nuclear regulatory agencies and in the public. The NRC issued a post-Fukushima regulatory requirements with completion date set at 12-31-2016. From what I know about the details of this, it is a very aggressive schedule. It's going to cost a lot of money to do, and it's going to take a lot of time to do it, and they don't have much time to get all that work done. And I believe that there's countries around the world that are going to do similar things in the attempt to try and say that the reactors have a better safety posture. Some of those items are mitigation strategies for severe accidents, reevaluate the seismic and flood hazards, do seismic walk downs in the facilities to confirm the design basis of the plant, develop new guidance for station blackouts. The NRC and other countries have been working on this for a year. They've just barely come out with these, and they're starting to have public hearings. So my take is make sure you get involved in going to the website for the NRC and get on their mailing list. Find out where these meetings are so that you can go and provide your input. Station blackout is coming down. I'm not sure when it is, but it's not far away. We're providing inputs through a formal written input to the NRC on that. And it's going to include lots of information that we feel strongly that they have to do or perhaps shut down until they can get it done. Develop new guidance and uh, for other areas in reactors like analyses that they performed and the assumptions that they make, the list could go on and on. And so the big question that we all have is, will it work? It remains to be seen. In the United States, like Japan, we don't have a lot of faith in the system that it, things are going to work when we try to do them. And I think a lot of the people that's presented this morning and this afternoon have indicated that. Some of the lessons learned that we came up with as a group have been covered by Nancy. But I'm going to go over a couple things in addition to that. Nuclear energy and nuclear weapons technologies are closely resulted, I mean related, resulting in military aspirations acting as a factor for energy policy decisions. Savannah Riverside, as we saw, was used in the early years, as well as Hanford, for the middle process in the weapons cycle. They needed to have reactors. They used those reactors, and they irradiated the materials to feed the weapons material for the bombs. And as those reactors shut down, that need didn't go away. And so we started seeing Watts Bar being used as a commercial power plant to produce electricity and at the same time to produce materials for nuclear weapons. At the center of the weapons cycle is the need for a reactor, and they can't do without it. And so that's what they did in order to try and accomplish their goals, and we see that around, around the world. We don't believe that it's right to use a power plant for that purpose. 
certainly not for that purpose. We believe that it's not right to go into nuclear proliferation, proliferation and decide to make MOX fuel. We believe that there's other ways to do it because MOX fuel and other things that they're doing to the commercial power plants are pushing the envelope of safety on those plants from where they were originally designed. We believe that, uh, in addition to that, we believe that there should be global awareness and support for humanitarian efforts, as we pointed out. We believe that there needs to be disaster research done and continue to be done by our group, and we're going to dedicate ourselves to do that so that we can provide a database for future reference, as Nancy pointed out. In closing, what I would like to say is there was a story that I heard online. Uh, I went some place and I picked up this story that was very touching to me. And the story goes like this. I remember an article where a small girl was being taken for a walk outside by her grandfather. They both had masks on. They had warm clothing so that they would stay warm when they went on their walk. As they were walking not far from their home, the little girl looked up to her grandfather and she said, Grandfather, can we go back home? I'm afraid of the radiation. This is the fear that the children of Japan will grow up with. Many will not live normal lives and many will be touched by illnesses caused by radioactive fallout. Let us all not forget Japan and help them see a ray of hope to sustain and keep them moving forward through these disasters. And do not forget the children. The new generation who must be led to be leaders for the future of Japan. Thank you very much. All right, let's thank all our speakers. We have a few minutes, um, about 10 minutes for question and answers. So if I could ask the, uh, the speakers to just come up and maybe sit in the front. All right, so we have our first question back there. Yes, uh, there's a two-parter, and I guess it's aimed uh, somewhat at uh, Dr. Patterson's remarks. The first is as much an observation. Uh, he talked about three things we need to be aware of with the nuclear establishment, the secrecy, then there's the cover-up, and then there's minimization. Um, I want to go to the minimization part and maybe go a little beyond that. Uh, I, I have a request, actually, to make of anti-nuclear and safe energy colleagues, and I believe I made this request at last year's conference, and that is that we abolish the word accident. I don't know if this translates uh, into Japanese the same way it would in English, but to, in English, the word accident kind of is acceptable because accidents happen. Oops, you know, we're supposed to be tolerant of it because it's commonplace. I, I want to put to us as activists the concept, these are no longer accidents, they are intentionals. They are deliberates. When you have a history like Dr. Patterson laid out, which goes from wind scale, the atomic veterans, Chelyabinsk, uh, Browns Ferry, Three Mile Island, now Chernobyl, now Fukushima, with the body of knowledge that the nuclear industry has, these are no longer accidents. They are no longer oopsies. And so I, I really want to urge colleagues, at least English-speaking ones, unless this does translates into Japanese, to avoid that word and get the industry off the hook. They know what they're doing. They made economic decisions to put those uh, diesel generators between the reactors and the oceans. That was an economic choice that TEPCO made. It was not an accident. And we feed into the minimization of Fukushima when we use the term. We do their homework for them. And so I would really like to ask activists to be more careful. Uh, you don't have to use my 
harsh terms of intentionals and deliberates, but find your own way to talk about catastrophe, disaster, whatever you want, but not minimization. Uh, now another nuance on the minimization part is, uh, and this is the direct question, uh, I've been hearing again the term radiophobia coming out of Japan, just like we heard after Chernobyl. All of the health effects that uh, are happening in Belarus, Western Russia, oh, it's all in their heads. And I'm beginning to hear this from Japan, so I was wondering if you would address that and if you know about it, and if not, give the audience a little background on this concept of radiophobia. Well, I think it, uh, it really sprang to the fore after Chernobyl, but it was present uh, with the Kishtim disaster as well. And uh, in the Kishtim disaster, uh, just two years ago, physicians were uh, told that they could no longer tell people that what, or write as a diagnosis, that their medical problem was due to the radiation from the Kishnam disaster. And the same thing occurred after uh, Chernobyl. And I began to hear this very early on uh, in radiation conferences and uh, speaking with Russian colleagues, uh, that all of this was due to just anxiety and fear of radiation, uh, any, any illness, uh, anything that, might be related to this. And I, granted, there is anxiety and uh, fear. As we mentioned, you can't see this stuff, you sm can't smell it, so it's quite natural to have uh, fear. But birds don't know about radiation phobia, okay? And, you know, the 1.8 million barn swallows that aren't around Chernobyl uh, were not suffering from radiation phobia, I can assure you. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's one of the answers that uh, we have to give. And you can talk, and I'd also be interested from our Japanese colleagues what they're hearing about this as well. I can just tell you that around SRS, some of the workers there who became ill at Savannah River site, um, were, their doctors were paid for by the site and they denied them records, they denied their records, they denied their, they moved them out of more dangerous work areas into administrative posts. Um, two of them, kind of whistleblowers, um, meet me at McDonald's and are very nervous when they talk to me. But um, I'm, we're trying to help people there. The other thing that is at Vogel, the whole culture of the area around Vogel and Shell Bluff, those people had a thriving community before the reactors came online. They fished, they swam. You know, yes, they pick cotton, soybeans, this and that. None of that goes on now. They're all afraid to drink the water. Their toilets back up. They have no cell phone. They can't get things on uh, information on on uh, computers because they don't have they don't have hookups. It's poverty, racism, and oppression. So they are they're living in fear and and of even showing up at any meetings to find out about things like this because then they're. Uh, they're designated as someone to go after, and their power bills double in little houses. So there's a lot of um, a lot of retribution that goes on in that county. My question's to Mrs. Paul and the South Carolina site. Um, you mentioned that you have a Native American tribe that lives on the coast there, and I was wondering if they've gotten involved with your activism with the uh, nuclear site. And also, there's a super site across the river, and I was wondering if they're at all transparent with the details of the issues that are going on and the cleanup? There's um, tribal law that, that our country is supposed to be acknowledging. And so the Yamasee, also the Cherokee, are, are working. Yamasee is sometimes spelled Y-A-M-A-S-I and sometimes Y-A-M-A-S-S-E-E. -E. But uh, Lori Johnston is the one um, who's working with us. But like most areas, they have very few funds even to get them up for meetings. Uh, a Leonard Peltier group just recently walked you know, across the country and up, t up to Washington. And they came through and they wanted to, we were gonna have a, a rally at the Vogel Gates, but then their diesel bus broke down. So these are, these are the realities of trying to organize um, of people. But yes, they're very well of Savannah Riverside. For some reason, the Vogel site, um, it's really beautiful, beautiful land. Um, and the woods where the natives, you know, and they buried their dead at the homes, and now those homes are all being turned over, and so all the spirits of the dead are being um, desecrated. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, they're, they want to be active, and they are as much as the money, and we can provide them support. Um, 
there were two questions. One is, what is the uh, status of uh, reactor number three? Um, because that seems to be the one that was uh, um, had the worst um, explosion or whatever. And the other question is, uh, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon recently came back from um, looking at the site, and he is, wants to put out a, uh, a global call for an international effort to um, uh, address the solution for Japan and for the world. So what is your kind of, how do you see that we should all act in that regard?パターソンさんがおっしゃったように情報が隠されてしまうということがあるからです。uh, I wish I could give you accurate information, but the truth of the matter is I really can't. And the reason for that is, as Dr. Patterson said, a lot of the information is um, hidden from us. And you saw that picture of the explosion in reactor number three earlier, and the truth of the matter is I can't tell you if it's a hydrogen uh, explosion or a, a nuclear explosion. ただ問題なのは爆発の原因がどうであったかということではなくて今 uh, but the, the problem at this point is not really figuring out what the cause of the, the explosion is, but where in the world is, is the, the melted nuclear material that is in the, the plant right now? あれば私たちは事故の現場に行って現場を見ることもできるし壊れた部分を触ることもできますそして一つずつ直していけばいいというのが火力発電所ですあ、but uh, unfortunately we we have no way of of uh, figuring this out if it was a for example a coal power plant uh, at this point we would be able to go in and and touch the material and look at it more closely and figure out what's going on but um, that's not the case with this kind of power plant. しかし原子力発電所の事故の場合には相手が放射能であるがために現場に行くことができません。見ることもできない。そして今回のような事故は先ほどアクシデントと呼んではいけないとあのご指摘あったまさにその通りなんですね。アクシデントというのは予想できな
Uh, that stuff you can't uh, melt unless you have 2,800 Celsius of heat uh, uh, put to it. でも実際にそれが溶けてしまったと言ってるわけです,言ってるわけですし、溶けてしまったものは、皆さんが家庭で使うお皿1枚、カップ1個というのではなくて、全体の重量は100トンあります。But they're, they're saying that it indeed melts, and the, the amount of materials that are in there, the ceramic material, isn't just like one plate or one cup like you have at home, but it's a hundred tons of it. ですすすすかかかららら当然そそそののの容容器器もも溶けけてててしししまままままうわけですから当然その容器も溶けてさらに落ちてしまいいまたた、so、kind of so、そしてそのじゃあ溶けた100トンの瀬戸物はどこに行ったかと。いうとと言うと、えー、原子炉格納容器ってコンテンメントというものの底に落ちましたコンテンメントもまたスティールでできていますただ東京電力はコンテンメントの床にはコンクリートの床張りがしてあってそのコンクリートがまだ溶かされるのずに残っているというそういう説明をしています。But what TEPCO has been telling us is that underneath that steel there's also a, a, a floor of cement and that cement hasn't melted yet. しかしそんなことを東京電力が見たわけでもないし、測ったわけでもないのです。単に彼らが計算をしたらそうなったと言ってるだけで、えー、そういうものは私は到底信じられないと思います。But it's not as if TEPCO has gone there and seen if this is the case or anything like that. It's basically ba based on、uh, calculations that they claim to have worked out that way. But I don't believe it for one second. ひょっとすると、すでに溶け落ちた炉心が格納容器皿を貫いて、すでに地面に潜り込んでいってるかもしれないと、そういう状態になっている可能性があります。There's at least a possibility that it's gone through、uh, all of it and, and leaked into the,、uh, into the ground. So, not to shimau to, ho sha no ga, kan kyo chu ni don don mole teiku. Tabun, ni hon no bai wa umi desu kere domo. Tui koto o fuse ge na kuna te shimau i masu no de, watashi wa gen shiro tate ya no ma ari ni, fukai, chika ni kabe o megura seru shi tiyo ga aru to, yu koto o kyo nen no go ga tsu, tsumari ichi nen mai kara shi chou shi te kimashita. Uh, when something like that happens, there's a strong possibility that it leaks into the environment and, of course, into the ocean that's, that's right there. And I've been advocating since late,、uh, last May that、uh, a big wall be built underground to prevent that from、uh, entering the, the rest of the environment. そそれでも何人かのの政政治治家家にこの提案をしましまたそしてその政治家たちはその必要があるということを認めたのですが残念ながら東京電力も日本の But、uh, unfortunately, neither TEPCO or the Japanese government has、uh, moved on, on this proposal. I know that this is the first thing that I have to do. I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that I have to do it in a way that Spread to the, the greater environment, and I'm going to do all I can do to、uh, prevent that from happening. So,、uh, there are two people with mics. We want to let them ask their questions, and then we're going to move 
into the round table, yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Wyden is great in Oregon. We met with him in March in Washington. And perhaps you know that Ed Markey from Massachusetts representative is really trying to get the conversation going on nuclear weapons and power. He said, we haven't had this discussion since the 80s. It's high time and we need to do it. He has a bill out there and he's trying to get 50 co-signers. So if you think you have a representative anywhere that could co-sign onto the Markey bill, um, go to nuclearagepeace.org uh, or just look up Ed Markey and sign on to his bill. But they've now gone to widen thinking that as a senator, he would be the obvious person to take the lead on this in the Senate, because right now it's just in the House. So, and he is very interested in doing so. So good for you. He, uh, he was in Japan, then he came back and sent a letter to the DOE and to um, uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, asking that an international effort be put forth to stabilize the fuel pool in Reactor 4, which maybe we'll hear more about. And uh, the reply he got uh, from them was that the Japanese have this under control and it's their thing, and so we're not going to enter into this. All right, so I have a question in the back first, and then we'll, and we'll have you ask a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a question about the rationale behind complete global disarmament, and given what we've learned about the terrible hazards of nuclear energy. I'm nervous to ask this question, but I feel like it hasn't been addressed yet. Um, would not, I, I feel like, suppose we completely disarmed, right, globally, it, it would only leave us more vulnerable to another Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that any entity, in a, in a world where no post-nuclear science, but um, complete disarmament, uh, any entity that then acquires a nuclear weapon has complete nuclear hegemony or nuclear hegemony over everyone else and can use a nuclear weapon at their will at their discretion and n you know no one can retaliate or anything so I guess what I'm saying is would not that leave the world more more vulnerable to a nuclear attack we're not down to the last 500 to talk about. I mean, thankfully, with the passage of the New START treaty under this administration, um, we got 71 votes on that. It first passed 93 to 6 under Herbert Walker Bush. Under Obama, it was like pulling teeth just to try to get the 67 votes we needed to pass the treaty. But if we take our it down to 1,500 or lower, I mean, we're making the world less vulnerable and we're in a leadership position, which is where we need to be. If we, the opposite is if we continue to just proliferate, that's not going to help us at all. So I think we have to have a leadership. When we get down, you're asking the deterrence, the huge deterrence question. When we get down to the last 500, 400, uh, you know, I think that mines are gonna have to tackle this, but we still need to be going down. We work a lot with Sam Nunn on this and Dick Luger, who is in trouble with his election too. We, we have a long ways to go and I'm not sure that, uh, you know, we're talking about abolition of nuclear weapons, but I think we need to talk about weapons of mass destruction and that's when, you know, we're talking about in the Middle East as well. Uh, there is work on this and George Schultz and Sam Nunn and the four horsemen uh, who, wrote, yeah, Kissinger, uh, wrote the book, uh, uh, Return to Armageddon, uh, our, uh, which was uh, Reykjavik, I'm sorry, Return to Reykjavik. Uh, you know, we came very close to this with Reagan and Gorbachev, and they met, and we had a big influence on Gorbachev, and he met with Reagan, and they agreed that they were going to abolish nuclear weapons by the year 2000. And then Reagan went back and met with Richard Pearl, the angel of darkness, and <laughs> Richard Pearl said, you can't do that, and moved him away from that. But in the, in the book, if you read the introduction that Nancy Reagan wrote, uh, Re uh, Reykjavik Revisited is the name of it, uh, she says it was his fond dream that we get rid of nuclear weapons. Um, so I think we can, we can move toward that. Uh, is it a tough go? Yes. But we now have the means to monitor nuclear weapons explosions, both through uh, r testing of radiation and through seismic means that are, are, are tremendous. Uh, I mean, they're, and they're in place all around the world. So we know if somebody sets off a nuclear weapon. 
Uh, so I think we have to have this as our goal and we have to move in this direction. We clearly have to move away from where we are now with, you know, 20,000 nuclear. I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, and it's ludicrous for the president to have his finger on the button to be able to launch thousands of nuclear weapons which in 12 minutes, which would destroy the world as we know it. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. The other side doesn't have to launch any weapons for that to happen, you know. Uh, it's craziness. And so we have to start talking about that. We have to be very aware of it. We have to bring it up to our politicians at election time and all the time. You know, we're making that effort. I, I recommend you read our report on limited nuclear war and the global cooling thing uh, because it's just chilling uh, reading. And um, so, anyway. For Dr. Patterson mainly, I think. Um, can you elucidate or, uh, the statistics on the infant mortality rate in the Pacific Northwest, both after Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima? So, you know, there were uh, studies that um, uh, uh, Janet Sherman and I um, can't remember the name of the other guy put out uh, on this. And uh, this is a tough one epidemiologically, and I'm not sure that I would, I mean, they're, they're kind of interesting, but my epidemiology colleagues, other than Janet, and Janet's a good friend of mine, uh, don't put much stock in this. And so uh, I think it's something that we need to look at, uh, and, uh, you know, this is what I said about this study. We need to look further at it and uh, make decisions about it. But we don't have to go there. Uh, and again, this is one of the things about, you know, it's sort of how many angels dance on the head of a pin in terms of uh, what happens. We know this is bad for us. We know it's bad to have these uncontrolled releases of radiation, and we know it has bad effects. Um, so I think we shouldn't get too bound up in uh, talking about those kinds of details, because then you get lost in the, in the argument, frankly. Mm -hmm. Just to drive the point home, really, yeah. because uh, nuclear radiation and exposure to it from the atmospheric bomb test is probably the single most undiagnosed cause of illness on the planet. Around the planet, perhaps, but uh, don't forget about medical radiation. You know, it, um, in terms of our population in the U.S., that's probably the highest source of radiation is medical radiation. And again, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, organizations trying to get doctors to cut back and think about uh, every time they order x-rays. Because as I, you know, a couple people raised their hands and knew how many x-rays they've had in their life. I have no idea how many x-rays I've had in my life or how much radiation I had with them. And when you look at CAT scans, uh, CT scans, one of the things that gets done all the time, if somebody comes in the emergency room with a bump on their head, a kid, and the first thing they get is a CT scan. They don't even see the doctor. The nurse orders it, you know. And that's a whopping dose of radiation to a kid's head and brain. Um, and then nobody keeps track of how many x-rays, how many they've had. And so it cum accumulates along with this other stuff. So I think it's a heightened awareness that we all have to have about radiation in general. And tritium, uh, do you, are you aware of Dr. Arjun Makajani at Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, IEER.org, has done a lot of studies about the effects of tritium um, on uh, mutagenic, carcinogenic, early miscarriages, birth defects. And, and so this is something that we always also work on, try to introduce a bill in the state to make the, um, the threshold for what is considered safe tritium exposure tighter because right now it's 20,000 picocuries per liter. I believe Colorado and California have gotten it down to 400 and 500, even if you got it down to 3,000. But the game is rigged from the inside. You know, they say, oh, it's within limits, and every nuclear power plant routinely emits tritium. So what is safe? I mean, it's which part of the pig do you want to poke to try <laughs> to, well, if it looks like a pig and smells like a pig, Correct. it's a pig. Right. Uh, and one, just one last uh, part uh, about Nak uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, it is quite curious that no historical data seems to be widespread, disseminated in a widespread fashion about the cancer rates after such a, an event. And perhaps that is not by accident. Uh, but uh, it is also true apparently that the people who did not suffer any symptoms from radiation sickness did so because of a macrobiotic diet, is this correct? 
So there are about 10 to 20,000 people who uh, were exposed to radiation through uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the, the American occupation uh, built this uh, facility called the ABBC, ABCC, uh, where they uh, uh, put everybody into the system and, and took statistics about the, their conditions. And for each person, they asked uh, uh, where they were when the when the bomb fell. Did they see the the flash? Um, were they inside? Were they outside? And things like that. And they tried to measure how much radiation they they were exposed to. And they ma made it mandatory that they visit the uh, ABCC every year. Uh, and this was not to treat them, but to record whether or not they were still alive to visit the the ABCC. <laughs> Uh, they learned many things from this, but, but the first thing they learned was that there was a, uh, many cases of leukemia in, in uh, uh, patients. And the longer that they studied this, uh, the more they found out. And uh, of course, they found out that there were many cases of other cancers besides leukemia as well. And as the years went by, they, they found out that no matter how far away you were uh, from the, the, the center of the, the explosion, you were still at a high risk of, of cancer. And as we heard from uh, Professor Patterson's uh, work, uh, the, the U.S. built the BIR, is it? BIR. Uh, commission, commission uh, that that's analyzed these results and and of course what they found was no matter how far you were no matter how little radiation you were exposed to you're at a high risk of cancer so その研究 and uh, this this uh, study is being uh, still conducted today under a, a, a institute of a different name the most recent research is showing that uh, among patients uh, uh, that they're studying, uh, they're not only exposed to uh, leukemia and other forms of cancer, but also heart disease and other kind of hereditary diseases as well. So and if you're interested in seeing this data, all you have to do is Google RERF, and you can see most of the data online, actually. This is the study that I mentioned before. When I heard 15 years ago or more, uh, they had, had cost $3.8 billion, and I've been trying to figure out recently what the current cost of it is. And they did things like set off nuclear weapons in Nevada and measured the neutron flux in tiles, like the tiles that were on roofs in Japan, to figure out how much radiation occurred at different distances uh, in this. And as uh, as was mentioned here, we're, we're currently seeing continued tumors at excess rates and now heart disease and strokes in people at excess rates. But remember, this was a one-time dose of radiation. It's quite different than the current picture that we're looking at. The current picture we're looking at is radiation that's being ingested, being breathed in, continually being brought in through the food chain, um, and, uh, and, and it will be that way through the rest of your life and my life. Uh, so that's very different from these approximations of radiation doses that, that occurred with the, the Japanese bombing, which was this one-time dose. Now we're talking about dosages that occur and with material that's in your body irradiating cells uh, throughout the rest of your life. And we don't know what that's going to do. We don't know. I think, uh, we're going to go ahead and just move right into the to the round table or question and answer session. So just give us a few minutes. We're going to have uh, Mr. Koide and Ms. Muto come up. Um, and I, I believe Professor Field has a few words. But let's give a hand to our speaker.